Okay, Mr. Marshall, you are good to go. We are live. We are recording. Amherst Media is here. And we have a Okay. Board. All right, we're off. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 18th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and as extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite our best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourself back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek, we know, is absent tonight. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman. Present. Board members, if, a tech, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment can also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can typically express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so first item on our agenda is approval of minutes from our past meetings. And the only minutes that I see on the agenda for tonight is the May 4th minutes from our last meeting. Um, board members, uh, any discussion about those minutes? Andrew, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I did wanna call out on page seven, the adjournment time of 7.52, just as a reminder how nice it was that we finished up at 752. But no, kidding aside, I am, uh, I'll put a motion out there to approve the minutes. All right, thank you for that motion. Would anybody like to second the motion? Johanna. I will second the motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Johanna. Board members, any other, any comments on the minutes other than how nice and short the meeting was and how complete the minutes are? All right, I don't see any hands. Uh, we'll go through and vote the minutes up or down. Uh, starting with Maria. Approve. All right, Tom. Approve. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Um, I'm gonna abstain because I wasn't there. Okay. 
And Johanna? Approve. And I'm an approve as well. So the motion passes with looks like five votes in favor, one abstention, and one absent. All right, so the time now is 6.38, and we'll move to the second item on the agenda. This is the general public comment period. And uh, as mentioned earlier, this is for, uh, we're, we're open to having comments on items that are not on our agenda for this evening. Uh, if you have comments on items on the agenda, please hold them until we get to that item uh, in the meeting. So I see uh, nine in public attendees. Does anyone want to make a public comment at this time? Okay, I see no hands for public comment. We will move on to the third item in the agenda. The time is now 6.38, I guess. And let's see, all right. So this item was advertised for 6.35, so we're not starting early. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding zoning bylaw article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance uh, with the historic commission to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw by rescinding Article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance or for the purposes of adopting a similar bylaw as a general bylaw. So just to clarify, this, is, this will be a vote to rescind Article 13 of the zoning bylaw, uh, which makes way for a new general bylaw uh, on the same topic. Are there any board member disclosures. Not seeing any. Uh, Chris, would you like to um, introduce this topic? Yes, I would, thank you. Good evening, my name is Chris Brestrup. I'm the planning director. And we're here tonight to hold a public hearing on the removal of Article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance for the purpose of adopting a similar bylaw as a general bylaw. I regret that Ben Breger, the planner who's been working with the Historical Commission on this amendment, and Jane Wald, chair of the Historical Commission, cannot join us tonight. They are attending the Historical Commission meeting that's occurring simultaneously with the planning board meeting. The Historical Commission and the planning department have been discussing this zoning amendment for several years and the commission supports this change and is ready to move forward. The planning board is familiar with this proposal, having heard about it last spring and again earlier this year. The demolition delay bylaw is proposed to be repealed from the zoning bylaw and a new preservation bylaw is proposed to be added to the general bylaw. Reasons for taking this out of the zoning bylaw and putting it into the general bylaw include the practice in most cities and towns in Massachusetts is to have this bylaw in the general bylaw. Um, another one is Massachusetts Historical Commission recommends this as a general bylaw rather than as a zoning bylaw. Um, another reason is the, his, the preservation bylaw is similar to or akin to the local historic district bylaw, which is in the general bylaw. Um, a fourth reason, for general bylaws, any appeal of a general bylaw is made to the court system rather than to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the last point is that the preservation of existing buildings is relevant to zoning, but it's not a core focus of zoning, and therefore it's more suited to being in the general bylaw. So the Planning Board is being asked to make a recommendation to the Town Council on the change to the zoning bylaw. While the planning board does not have a formal role in the adoption of a new general bylaw, the board is welcome to offer comments to town council about the new general bylaw. In your packets, you have the existing Article 13 proposed to be rescinded, 
and the new article proposed to be added to the general bylaw. The planning department has reviewed the language of the new general bylaw with our attorney, Joel Bard of KP Law on at least two occasions in September of 2021 and in April of 2022. And the recommendations of attorney Bard have been incorporated into the new language of the general bylaw. With regard to the general bylaw, it does the following. It creates a new certificate for applicants that will help to separate the historical commission process from the building department process. The building department grants a demolition permit. Um, it also creates a two-step review process. And the first step is a de determination as to whether a building is significant or not. And if it is found to be significant, a public hearing is held to determine whether the building should be preferably preserved. Once that decision has been made about whether the building should be preferably preserved or not, either a demolition authorization is issued or a preservation order is issued. The CRC or Community Resources Committee has reviewed the proposed rescission and the new language. On April 14th, 2022, the CRC held a public hearing on the rescission of Article 13 and the addition of the new general bylaw. The CRC voted unanimous, unanimously on April 14th to recommend that the council rescind the zoning bylaw, Article 13, uh, with an effective date upon the effective date of the adoption of a similar general bylaw. They didn't vote on the new bylaw at that time because the historical commission was still working on some final language. So um, the planning staff met with two members of the historical commission during that time period and worked out the final language. On May 12th, 2022, the CRC reviewed the revisions to the new language and voted unanimously to recommend the town council adopt the new language of the general bylaw. And the planning board has the new language in its packet. Town council will be holding its first reading on the repeal and replacement of the demolition delay and preservation of historically significant buildings bylaw changes on June 6th, and then hold a second reading on June 13th, at which they hope to uh, take a vote. Um, I would suggest once you've had a chance to um, talk about this, that I have a motion that I think might be appropriate. I won't read the motion right now, but when you get to the point of voting, I can read the motion. I think I sent it to Doug um, this evening. So thank you for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. I actually have a question right off the bat, uh, prompted by your statement that town council is gonna be reading this uh, in the near future. Um, since this, since what we're, what we're to deliberate tonight is a change to the zoning, doesn't uh, town council need to refer this to us at some point? It for, was referred. It was referred it was already? Referred, yes. Um, okay, so the hearing we're in this evening is been within the time duration? Yes, the referral occurred on March 21st. Okay. So we're still within the time period yes. during which the public hearings for CRC and planning board need to occur. That's correct, yep. Okay. All right, so, I, so our vote tonight will be to make a recommendation to town council up or down and, or with changes or something else. On the rescission, yes. Yeah. Okay. And you can offer recommendations on the other part too, if you choose to. Right, but those are those will be a sort of advisory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. So you may have just answered my question. Um, so because it's a zoning bylaw and we're voting on whether it should be rescinded, do we can vote, I mean, presumably we're saying we're okay on that because we approve or like the new language of the new amendment. So are we gonna vote on that also, or is that just up to us? Will, will council, town council refer that to us or are we just gonna send along that? I think the new language that's in the general bylaws, do, the approval and adoption of those general bylaws does not go through the planning board. 
Okay, so I would be I'd be very comfortable if we also tonight voted to recommend, and I guess I could make a motion to recommend that this um, new version of the demolition, the preservation of historically significant buildings by law be, um, you know, passed by the town council. So I'd like to see these those things paired. Okay. All right. Oh, it looks like Nate has joined us. Welcome, Nate. I, I hope your athletic event this afternoon went well. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, board members, uh, any any conversation about this? Uh, I do know this is. We've talked about this a couple of times. We have reviewed the proposed uh, general bylaw previously and there were comments made and I know Janet met with planning staff about some of the concerns she had. So we've been through this a fair amount, but it's been a little while since we talked about it. Um, does anybody want to talk about it more tonight? Don't all raise your hand at once. Okay. I'm good. Janet, I guess yours, yours is the hand. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. So since we discussed this at length in our last meeting sometime in the dark winter, I think the I think there's only been one major change, which is going from um, you know 50 years to 75 years. Are there like and I was hoping Chris could or um, Nate could talk to us about that. Are there any other changes to this language, like significant changes in this um, draft that I'm holding? from our last draft. May I uh, Chris, go ahead. Um, so there have been a few minor changes. One of the changes was that um, the determination of significance, whether a building is significant or not, has been, um, the language has been made more flexible. So it's really up to the historical commission to decide whether it's the whole commission or a designee from the historical commission or a designee from the planning department um, staff makes a determination as to significance. So this bylaw doesn't spell out that particular thing. It leaves it up to the commission. Um, another thing that this uh, bylaw does is that it um, removes the third uh, portion of the definition of demolition. So initially we had demolition um, in three parts. The first part was initiating the work of total destruction of an entire building with the intent of completing that. The second part was any act of pulling down, destroying, removing or raising 25% or more of the front, back or side elevations of the building. The gross square footage of each elevation, including wall area, roof area and exposed foundation area calculated separately. And then the third one was for buildings listed on the Amherst Inventory of Historic Buildings, accepted by a vote of the commission and updated periodically, the act of changing, modifying, or removing important architectural elements from a building, which elements define the historical integrity of the design, including but not limited to doors, windows, stoops, porches, chimneys, and similar elements, except for exemptions as found in section C3 of the bylaw. So what the um, planning staff and the historical commission agreed to was to um, remove that part C for now. Um, there is no um, authenticated inventory of historic buildings. We have um, pieces here and there, and, and Nate might be able to speak to that better than I can. It includes about, I think, 1200 buildings altogether, some of which you, would not recognize as being um, historically significant. Um, so the board, the commission felt that it needed to spend more time, the commission and the planning staff, developing in the inventory and voting on the inventory, having it vetted by the commission before we relied on it in any way. Um, and if we don't have the inventory to rely on, um, we're also opening ourselves up for, um, you know, potentially hundreds of reviews um, because you know, we could be reviewing um, things like Echo Hill houses that have been around since the 1960s. 
so we don't really want to get into that at this time. So we've decided with the Historical Commission to remove that Section C and the CRC um, <clears throat> thinks that's a good idea as well. And um, so that that was also a change. Um, trying to think if there were any other changes. Um, the delay period um, for the demolition delay remains at 12 months. So that hasn't changed. Nate, can you think of any other changes? No, I was just looking through the packet. Um, I didn't see any. I mean, they're still the same. You know, we try to streamline definitions, the process and everything. And so all those, you know, there, nothing has really changed there, but from what was, you know, what's in the bot, you know, what's currently there to what's being proposed is a big change, but not the different versions that the planning board reviewed. Um, I think the declaration of policy or the purpose, I think there was right, some minor changes, but um, nothing, nothing else. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chris and Nate. Janet. So does the CRC support adding um, that back the sec, the, um, if once there is a historic authenticated historic inventory that you can't remove like iconic pieces of it. Is there support for that idea um, that you'll be Here. trying to? Excuse me, I raised my hand. Thanks, Janet. Chris? Um, the CRC really didn't discuss whether they would um, support that addition back again. Um, it, that was really an idea that the planning staff discussed with the Historical Commission as something that could be done in the future when the inventory is, um, has been established. Thanks, okay. Chris. And thanks, Janet. Okay, uh, board members, any other uh, any other discussion? All right. So uh, I guess we'll move right on to a vote. Um, Chris, shall I read the motion that you, or do you want to read it? You can read it if you have it up, yep. I do. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll make the motion on behalf of the board. Um, I move that the planning board recommends that town council rescind article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance for the purpose of adopting a similar bylaw as a general bylaw with an effective date upon the effective date of the adoption of the similar bylaw as a general bylaw. And um, so this is, so our recommendation is contingent on town council adopting the general bylaw. And we won't have a, we wouldn't have a period where there is no bylaw on this topic in town. Would anybody like to second that? Janet, I see your hand. Should I take that as your second? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Johanna, you'll get another one. Okay, um, no further ado. We'll start at the end of the alphabet, which would be Johanna. Hi. Thank you, and Janet. Hi. Uh, Andrew. Hi. Tom? Right. Maria? And I'm an I as well. So that's six in favor, no opposed, one member absent. Thank you all. All right, so we'll move on to item four in the agenda, I believe it is. Yes. I'm Doug? Yes, Janet. I was hoping to make a motion to recommend the ver the version, the draft version of preservation of historically significant buildings um, that the planning board would recommend adoption of this version to the town council before we move on. Okay. Um, I don't have a date on this though. So I'm wondering, I'd like to be a little more specific. Well, you could say the version that was part of the planning board packet on May 18th. 
Okay, so I will say that. <laughs> so moved. Does anyone want to second that? Uh, Maria, I saw your hand next. I just have a question for Janet. Why why are you bringing this up? I don't understand why this motion is happening. Oh, well, because we've been reviewing it over and over again, and I think it's a really strong version. Um, I think it encompasses a lot of concerns that everyone's raised, and I, I think the board, you know, we're kind of letting go of our bylaw, and I, I think it'd be great for the board to recommend this, this draft. I think it's been six years in the making when, according to Jane Wald, Okay, thank you, Janet. Maria, did you have any further questions? Yeah, is that the standard thing that we usually do, Chris? Or I just, I've never, it's like, is that necessary? Chris. Um, it's really offering um, your comments to the town council on this matter. Um, so we haven't been through this very many times where we take something out of the zoning bylaw and put it into the general bylaw. Um, but I, I think it would be it would be appropriate, although not um, required for you to do this. You're required to vote on the rescission. You're not required to vote on the new bylaw, but you're offering your support for the new bylaw. I would say that's what you would be doing if you voted for this motion. OK, thank you, Chris. Um, so we have a motion from Janet. Did anybody, um, Andrew? I'll second the motion. Okay, thank you. Um, any any discussion from board members? Not seeing any. All right. Uh, oh, Johanna. I was just going to say, I don't have a problem with it. It feels a little. I don't know. There's part of me that feels like it's a little bit redundant given the motion that we just passed, but you know, no harm, no foul. Okay, thanks, Johanna. I, I, I will say I'm going to abstain. I, I think this is an unnecessary act on our part, and it's not, you know, it's it's really kind of irrelevant to the town adopting it. Janet. Um, so I think, you know, part of the reasons for it is that, you know, we've all worked on it and looked at it, and I think most of us support it. I also, I'm just very cognizant that Jane Walt had said they've been working on this for six years. And I thought if we can give a little heft to it and help it get through the town council and support the work of the historic commission, um, they've just worked really hard on it. It's a good draft and it, you know, it kind of incorporates a lot of people's different concerns. And also it just makes the whole process more clear to somebody who is a property owner or somebody who's in a butter or somebody in, in town hall or the historic commission. So I think, you know, everything's less confusing. It's a stronger, more flexible thing. So, you know, I'd love to see us support that and help the historic commission. Okay, thank you. And Chris, you said that the CRC had discussed both the rescission and the new amendment. Yes, and the CRC voted to um, recommend the new amendment. Okay. All right, Janet, I'll assume your hand is now a legacy hand. Um, any other any other discussion? Okay, we'll do a roll call. Um, and starting with Maria. Abstain. Uh, Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Uh, Janet. Hi. And Johanna? Abstain. And I will abstain also. So, Chris, we have three members voting in favor, three abstentions, and one absence. Thank you. Sure. Chris, since we did not achieve four, am I correct that the motion failed? Or, or is, we had three out of six, a 50% result. I think that's the case. I think okay. what you said is the case. 
All right. All right, thank you. Um, so I don't see anything else on that particular topic. Um, could we have a motion? Do we need to close the hearing? That's a good idea, yes. Okay. And having, having gotten to this, Chris, I'm gonna ask another question, which uh, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to ask. Um, we, got, we went all the way through that in a public hearing and we did not ask for public comment. Oh. And well, um, you can reopen the public hearing. It's the same night and you're the same group and you're doing it in the same meeting. So I think you can reopen the public meeting hearing. Well, if we, you want well to. We, ha we haven't closed the hearing, but we've had the vote. Right. So that's true. Yeah. So I think uh, before but we close should, the hearing. But I think you should. Right. So you, before you close the public hearing, you should ask for public comment. Right. And uh, so members of the public. Uh, my apologies. Uh, does anyone want to comment on this rescission of Article 13 of the bylaw? Uh, I see one hand from Jennifer Tao. We could bring her over and once again, name and address. No, can you hear me? I can't tell if I'm. We can oh, hear okay. you, Jennifer. I'm unmuted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, good. So I'm Jennifer Taub at 259 Lincoln Avenue. I guess it's a little late. Um, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as a resident, but I'm also on the CRC. Um, and um, I, you know, would have, I, I think a vote um, in favor of that motion, you know, might've just been helpful to the council in ensuring that um, that stronger bylaw would be the one that prevailed. So I know I'm a little late, but I would have spoken in support um, before the vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. I don't see any other hands from the public. Uh, Tom, I see your hand. You are muted. I was going to move to close the hearing. Okay. Well, Chris, uh, we've now had, uh, Public, we've had an opportunity for public comment and a little bit of public comment. Uh, do you think it's appropriate that we go ahead and close the hearing? I think so. I don't see anyone else's hands, hand up right. in the attendees. All right. Uh, I, I think before I do that, board members having heard the public comment, would any of you want to change your vote? Uh, not seeing anyone who is saying they would want to change their vote. So in that case, I'm not going to try to get into doing a revote. And uh, would anyone like, sounded like Tom, you wanted to close the public hearing? Yes, so moved. Thank you, Tom. And Maria? Second. Thank you, Maria. Uh, if we could have a vote to close the public hearing, we'll start with Johanna. Approved. All right, thank you. Uh, Janet? Sure, approved. Uh, Andrew? Aye. And Tom? Aye. Maria? Approve. And I'm an approve as well. All right, so that passed six in favor. Okay, so the time now is 7.06, and we'll move on to the next public hearing on the agenda this evening. All right, so this is a site plan review. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2022-13, UMass Five College Credit Union, 
398 to 406 Northampton Road, request site plan review approval under sections 3.358.0 and 5.0431 and 8.5 of the zoning bylaw to redevelop 398 and 406 Northampton Road into a credit union branch, including drive-through facilities. The project includes 34 public are 34 parking spaces, bicycle racks, wall signs, landscaping, and an oversized monument sign. The parcels are map 13D, parcels 47 and 48 in the BL zoning district. Is there any board member disclosure concerning this project? Uh, Andrew. Yeah, uh, my wife works for the credit union and, and uh, she she had shared information with uh, this as the news is starting to become public, but that's all. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other disclosures? Johanna. I'm a member of the credit union. I don't think that gives me any material influence, so I don't think I need to abstain from anything given the ethics laws, but just wanted to put it out there. Okay. Thank you. I'm a member as well. Okay, Tom. Don't I. Andrew. <laughs> We've almost got a quorum here. Okay. Uh, Chris, do you want to introduce this or should we move right on to Mr. Reedy and the design team? Uh, you are muted. Sorry. Um, so yes, move on to the uh, applicant and Nate is the person to go to with questions on this because he's more familiar with it than I am. Okay. All right. All right, Mr. Reedy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of UMass Five College Federal Credit Union in a very exciting application for the redevelopment of a couple of parcels, as the chairman noted, 398 and 406 Northampton Road here in Amherst zoned uh, limited business. And so uh, needing site plan review approval from the board, hopefully this evening. Excited to introduce the development team. Um, so we've got Elon Tierney from Cunardal Architects, the architect for the project. We've got Chris Chamberlain and Rachel Loeffler from Berkshire Design, um, who are the engineer and landscape architect uh, for, the, for the project. Um, I guess a, a little bit of background, and I'll share my screen just to orient everyone to, to the sites. Uh, and I know that the board, or at least some members of the board, had a site walk, I believe it was Monday. Um, US5 is very excited about this project being sited properly on Route 9, Northampton Road. Um, I think you'll see a lot of sustainable aspects, you know, um, porous pavement, rain gardens, a lot of landscaping. I think you'll see a wonderful building design um, from Kuhn Riddle. And we have started the process with the Conservation Commission, as I think Ms. Brestrup circulated to the board, uh, that we had started the process. The commission did close the hearing. They're working on their conditions for their order of conditions. And we expect to get that order of conditions issued, I believe it's May 22nd. Uh, we've also submitted because the site has uh, two Morton buildings and then a single family dwelling on it, the single family dwelling is of an age that requires uh, historical commission approval for its demolition. Um, and so that application had been submitted to the historical commission. We were on for hearing this evening, um, but we've asked to continue the historical commission hearing so that we could be here with you uh, this evening. So what I'll do just somewhat quickly to orient everyone is share my screen. You'll see the Amherst GIS map. You've got the parcels. So this is where the Morton buildings are. Route 9 moving in a uh, southwest to northeast direction. You've got the... Uh, yep. Uh, we can't see you. As you have started sharing the screen, 
at least on my screen, it hasn't come up yet. Okay. Oh, I had seen I it. Saw, I saw oh. the screen share. Oh, did I, you? I saw it I too. Okay, maybe it's just me. Go ahead again. Sure. I'll... I have I have the drawings in front of me, so don't need to see it. Yeah, and we'll and this is this is more for just general background, um, just to give folks a sense of context for the sites that we're dealing with. This is just your Amherst GIS aerial. You've got Hawkins Meadow to the east, Green Leaves Drive to the west. Um, the new Aspen development a little further west. The town line is this line right here. You know, moving further east, you've got this is where that one university drive south development is, Ginger Garden on the corner, um, gas station vacuums across the street. Um, and then Johnny's uh, roadside diner. You've got, I think, liquor store, pet store, grocery store, maybe a Marshall's. I haven't been there in a while. Um, and so then here, I just wanted to show you uh, the, the Google Street View just to give you a sense. Um, this is that single family home that we're talking about going through the demolition process with the Historical Commission. And here is the Zablit Motor Works uh, current operation. And then as you pan, there's um, fencing that's, uh, I believe, owned by Hawkins Meadow. And then you've got a row of arborvitaes at about their maturity of about 15 feet. And then you've got, you know, if I was able to move a little bit further here, additional arborvitaes in this jog. And these will actually get to be about 60 feet in height. So they're, they're green giant arborvitaes. So as I'm sure Rachel will talk about a little bit later with site screening um, from a landscaping perspective, you know, we believe that the, the proposal with the downcast lighting um, and the siting of the building will, will prevent any light trespass. Um, and then if you see, as you probably saw on the site visit, there's existing vegetation to the, to the rear and then also to the west. So this is a nice spot, a little bit on an island. We've, we're fortunate to have existing vegetation already on that easterly side. I'll bring it back here once more and just turn around and show you, you know, where this where this is and how it's already screened from Hawkins Meadow. Give you perspective of what's around it. Commercial uh, to the northeast, and then we've got commercial right across the street. You can see the size of the signs in the general area here, right up along Route Nine. And then, as you know, Route Nine is a divided highway um, with uh, lanes in each direction. So. You know, with that, I'll, I'll be back to, to kind of talk to you about use operation traffic a, a little bit, but I think probably makes sense for us to turn it over to Rachel to dive into the site plan. And so I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll let Rachel walk you through uh, the site. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Rachel, welcome. Thanks. Um, can everyone see my screen? Um, I'm here, I'm joined, um, my name is Rachel Uffler. I'm with Berkshire Design Group out of Northampton and I'm joined here, I'm a principal there and um, I'm joined here with Christopher Chamberlain, also a fellow principal in the office. Um, and we're, we've are we been working together with KRA Architects who will also be speaking tonight about, about the building um, and with a wider team of an arborist and um, a signage consultant and a lighting consultant. So, um, so this is a, an image of what we envision the project looking like from Route 9, um, a new building along Route 9, um, set, set back from, from the road. Um, and I'm gonna talk you through what that, how that fits on the site. Um, when we started thinking about placing, placing the building on the site, we started thinking about at what point along Route 9 could you see the, see the building and know to turn in? And we really, we really got into site distances at travel speeds and what that at what point along the nine will you see. So this is a this is our site that we're talking about today. This is the garage portion and the residential portion of the site. This is Route 9, University Drive, the Green Leaves development back here. Um, and there's existing stand of vegetation along this corner blocking views of the site. So around 45 
I'm sorry, Rachel. Uh, Andrew, I see your hand. Is this an yeah. uh, urgent question? Or I was just going to ask if you could zoom in a little bit more on that. Oh, sure. just, yeah, that's all. Thanks. I don't um, have to go that much, but just so we can, there's okay. no dead space. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so a car traveling 45 miles an hour along Route 9 has about a 60 degree cone of vision. Um, and so as you're coming along Route 9, we don't anticipate actually starting to see and recognize that it is a bank that you can turn into until you until you've gotten about midway down midway into the site um, so that really informed our placement of the building and our entry and exit onto the site um, so this is a survey showing the existing conditions as they exist today this is again route nine this is the garage building and the residential building today there's an existing curb cut driveway for the residential building and existing curb cut into the garage that's right up against the property line. And as Tom mentioned, there are Arbor Vitae, which screen the site from its adjacent neighbors. Um, in addition, there are about 200 square feet of wetlands on the back portion of the property and a significant portion of about 30% of the property is within the 100 foot wetland buffer. The project did go before the Conservation Commission last Wednesday and, and we closed the public hearing and next at the next meeting they're going to um, grant, grant uh, orders of conditions. Um, in addition, there are some mature trees along the west side of the property and our arborist has walked the site and tagged them individually and given us advice as to which trees may need to come down, which trees may need to be root spate, air spaded, which trees may need to be trimmed. Um, we also met with the neighbor, uh, Green Leaves neighbor, and walked the site with them as some of these trees are on their property um, and talked through what we would be doing. And Rachel, um, yeah. I noticed that the Arbor Vitae are not on your property. At Correct. least that's the way it looks on the LC 100. I think um, some of their branches come over a little bit, yeah. So as long as that adjacent owner decides to leave them, they'll be effective as screening. Correct. Okay, thank you. Also existing on site uh, in 2013, the, the owner put in a subsurface infiltration system, uh, which outfalls into, into the area out back. Uh, there's an additional stormwater collection system that actually connects to the mass DOT system. So when, as we're looking at the site, we're thinking about how to balance those two points of release. Um, the demo plan, this, so this is the demolition and erosion and sedimentation control plan shows the limit of work during construction that we anticipate. Uh, we anticipate fencing off the site, having a tracking pad, having a gate, a lockable gate, um, putting down erosion control barriers around the property to prevent sediment from running off. And then um, we've detailed each tree, which tree may be removed or which tree may be air spaded. Um, the Conservation Commission requested, and these are some of the changes that they requested we add to clarify that the invasive species removal on site will be um, performed by a certified remover um, and that they prefer a method of uh, cutting and dabbing rather than foliar spray. So to help orient you, the proposed project and how that relates to the new, new work in red is that survey information that you just saw of the Route 9 area, the existing drive into, into the um, garage parking service, the existing residence and their existing driveway. This black line, thick black line is the new footprint of the bank. And as you can see, it's located right in between all these different buildings. Um, in addition, instead of um, coming into the site and having a turn in right when you, right when you enter the site and moving, moving around, the, around this way, um, we, we decided that given the sight lines and the access that it made sense to actually place the entry point into the site at the furthest um, eastern portion of the site so that as people are driving down Route 9, the divided highway will be coming this way, they would have a chance to see, see the sign, see the building, and then turn into our project. Um, 
and the project proposes one way travel around around the site. So as you come into the site, um, there are there are 25 parking spaces that are for visitors, um, two of which are ADA with a fully accessible direct access to the front door. Um, you loop around, there are three ITMs. Those are interactive teller machines that during the day, someone has a video interface with you as you pull up. And then after hours, you can use as a standard ATM. There's a drive a drive through lane to bypass all that. Uh, and then continues, and you can continue on out with a right turn only onto Route 9. There are uh, nine additional parking spaces, which are anticipated for staff with an accessible parking space for the staff only entrance. Um, in the front of the site, we are, we're, we are um, devoting a large portion of the area for a rain garden for uh, LED stormwater infiltration. Um, it's also using it as a way to showcase UMass Five's commitment to sustainability and environmental stewardship. Um, and all the asphalt on site is, uh, um, is porous paving. So instead of having to have a subsurface infiltration system or a large basin, we're actually handling all the stormwater within the profile of the paving, which we're pretty excited about. I should also say that we are, there's an existing bus stop here on the corner, right on the property line, um, which is used quite a bit. Every time we've been there, we've seen people standing waiting and we're proposing to move the bus stop further down past that entry drive to actually help eliminate um, vehicular conflicts and allow people coming, passing by to have time to let the bus know they need to stop and make the stop here. So this is about 38 feet from the intersection of the drive to allow a bus the length to stop. Um, util uh, Utilities wise, um, we have, it's a great site to develop. There's a lot of municipal utilities really close right up in the road. Um, we'll definitely be after this process, be going to mass DOT to get the um, highway access permit for the curb cuts and then a utility access permit for connections to water, sewer and electric in the right of way. Um, but there is a water main along, along Northampton Road. We did a fire flow test for it and we have sufficient water press pressure for the project. Um, we're proposing a six inch water line that connects to the back to the mechanical room and we have a separate, a separate stub for fire water suppression system and a potable water system. Um, we're putting in a new sewer line connection. We actually investigated the sewer line, existing sewer line on site uh, that, that is in a different location, but it, it, it was not, it was clay and it was not in good condition. So we decided to go ahead and, and pr provide a new um, sewer line connection. And then um, any of the stormwater stormwater from the roof is collected and split in two. It go, some of it goes to the front rain garden and some of it goes into the back level spreader area. The areas that are um, any overflow, emergency overflow for the rain garden in the front, uh, we will reuse the existing connection to the mass DOT to handle that. Um, and a, an extensive stormwater report has been prepared for this project and Chris can speak to that more if you have questions, but we are reducing, we're improving the site significantly. We're reducing both the velocity and the volume water leaving the site on this location and this location from where it is today. Um, during initial review with the fire department, they suggested that they would like to have another fire hydrant um, for access during, if there were in case of emergency. Um, and so we've been working with Chris Bascom back and forth. And this is the location that he's comfortable with and we're comfortable with placing a, a fire hydrant for his access for trucks. And then this is a diagram showing the movement of the largest Amherst fire truck coming into the site, making that turn, moving through the turnaround and then exiting the site.
planting wise, we're super excited um, to be able to work with UMass 5 and develop a wonderful planting plan that features natives and works with rain gardens and provides habitat for pollinators. So we have a mix of different different types of plant mixes, some that are um, pollinators for sun, some that are pollinators for more shade. We have a, a rain garden planting with a lot of carexes, sedges and carexes and some flowers. And then we have some areas of ferns and birches and screening trees of balsam fir, some good natives in the back. Um, during our site visit with the neighbors at Green Leaves, they, um, they really like the image of their sign with green vegetation behind it. Um, and they, they asked if we would be willing to consider adding more screening trees along this property line. And um, our client is thrilled to help uh, to, to accommodate them, but we would like to take some time to review that, those species options with both our client and with green leaves um, before finalizing that. Um, lighting, we we heard comments from you that it's very hard to read the lighting plan. So we have two options here for each of them. Um, we've taken a pass at the lighting plan provided by our, our lighting designer, um, having color coding, what, 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 fault, what image goes where. Um, we also have an illustrative rendering of the photometrics where the the lighter, the lighter color yellow is a less dense light, and then the darker yellow is a more intense light. So the lighting strategy on site is to use a range of different fixtures for to provide, to provide safety um, and security for the bank. We're using a mixture of pole, pole mounted site lights around the perimeter of the parking lot. We have some shallow downlights that are in recessed in the canopy of the building. Uh, we have a couple of wall lights that are in the Goshen stone walls and several baller side lights along pedestrian pathways where, where the lighting levels were low enough that we needed a little bit more support. And then there are some additional uh, wall mounted, some additional lights of the building um, to enhance the arrival experience. So on the plan, the red dots are all the pole mounted lights pointing in towards the parking lot. So this in arrival bay of parking is, is illuminated by the pole mounted lights, as well as this visitor's area. Um, and there are a couple more pole mounted lights along the periphery. At the front of the building, along the sidewalks along the front, um, the purple Colored lights are all bollard lights, um, illuminating the pathways. So that's the same for both this entry and this entry over here. Um, and then the magenta colored lights are the, the wall lights that are inside the Goshen stone walls. I, I forgot to mention that the, we do have some curved Goshen stone seat walls that um, create outdoor seating areas at the front entry. So that'll be a really nice cascade effect for the lights. Um, all the lights are dark sky compliant and shielded, um, shielded from overhead. And then on the second floor, the, there is a there is a deck space over top of ITMs. It's both a canopy to protect the ITMs, but also an overflow space, which Elon will talk about a little bit more with the building plans. Um, and that area also has illumination with um, with a couple with a lot of these these magenta lights are um, lights recessed in, in the railing. So it's a very subtle dots of light. Um, and then there's some additional lights right at the edge of the building. We also got um, a question about the dumpsters and we have been working with USA Recycles uh, to accommodate the, the dumpster movements. And just last week, so our original design is based upon, um, is based upon a rear loading dumpster truck, which USA Recycles does have in its fleet currently. 
Um, but just last week, they informed us that they actually would love to discontinue that truck and they'd like us to, they'd like to go to a crop loading truck on all new projects. Um, so we are, we have looked at a possibility of taking, flipping that dumpster enclosure a 90 degrees so that a dumpster, crop loading dumpster truck can come in the main entry, move around, pick up the, pick up the dumpster and then continue on its way. Um, so I'd like to reiterate, this is, the project is a 1.4 acre site. Um, we, we meet the, we comply with the lot coverage and um, setback requirements. It's a two-story building. We're promoting four bike racks, 34 bike spaces. We have three, DA, three ADA spaces and a, and a new bus stop location. All right, thanks, Rachel. Um, I guess the, I, I guess I'd like to know, uh, would you guys like to move on into the architectural drawings now, or should we take questions on the site drawings and talk that through first? As, as far as we're concerned, whatever whatever the board wants, it might be good to go through architectural in case. Elon mentioned something that might uh, answer a question about the site or, or she, she'll probably talk about the site a little bit. So it might be better to go through it and then come back and talk about site architecture. And then we can talk about um, traffic signage and the use, if that's okay. Okay, then Elon, you're on. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Elon Tierney. I'm president at Kuhn Riddle Architects, located right here in downtown Amherst. Um, I'm really excited to share this potential project uh, for the UMass 5 College Credit Union. As Rachel mentioned, Kuhn Riddle and Berkshire Design Group have been working with UMass 5 for a couple of years. Um, to find a more prominent and visible location uh, along Route 9 for their flagship branch. And this is a really great location for them. Um, in addition to the increased visibility, some of the primary goals uh, that are driving this design are sustainability, um, creating a welcoming place for members, visitors, and staff, um, and a building and site design that represents the UMass 5 mission. Uh, its vision and its principles. So just a reminder, the architectural design is still in schematic design, um, while the site design is closer to uh, construction ready. Um, so just keep that in mind, we are not 100% done with our, our design. So this is the, um, the main image that we've been sharing with you. Uh, uh -oh. No, it's not answering. Here we go. Okay. So as Rachel mentioned, um, visibility is really important. And so we looked at it, uh, how people would be able to see the building going in both directions on Route 9. And this image is when you're pulling out of University Drive onto Route 9. It's highly visible, which is really great, um, considering it is UMass, um, even though it's five college it starts off with UMass. So all the folks coming from UMass will see this flagship branch um, as they come onto Route 9. On the other hand, as you're coming from the west um, or from Hadley going towards Amherst Center, um, as Rachel said, there's a lot of plantings right on that corner. And so visibility of the building is difficult. And um, what we've done to try to make it visible is bring the monument sign closer to the sidewalk and the road. Um, so it is highly visible. Uh, people are traveling at a higher rate of speed. And as Rachel said, it is one of the reasons why we decided to put the entrance um, on the far side of the site. So people have time to see it and make a turn into the, the property. As you turn into the driveway, this is the uh, image that you will see um, the front of the building faces north and then the side is east facing. We've got a really nice glassy corner that shows the vertical circulation or the main stair of the building. 
the uh, pergola on the front. The wooden pergola is meant to draw people in and also representative of the um, timber structure that we hope to use inside the building. Um, we are hoping to have a robust envelope uh, with energy efficient systems, low flow water fixtures, healthy materials that have a low carbon footprint and an ultimate goal of a net zero energy building. Not 100% design yet, but those are our goals. Um, we haven't selected all the materials yet, but uh, we are looking at a composite siding material and energy efficient windows that look substantially like what you're seeing here. At the front of the building, you, this is showing the um, signage that's on the building, the large sign at the top of the building. The letters will glow at night um, when it gets dark out. And then there's also the mission statement sign that's right near the door. And there will be a um, wall washer light that's in the ceiling that washes light across that mission statement sign. Um, as Rachel said, all of the fixtures are pointed downwards, dark sky compliant. Um, the light fixtures in the front here are tucked up in between the beams in these three beams underneath this roof area and shed light down onto the walkways. Uh, so this building is ideally situated and um, oriented for solar exposure. We've got this little butterfly roof and that southern facing roof we hope to uh, cover with PV um, and get to that net zero goal. We did keep the form of the building intentionally simple, both for energy efficiency and uh, cost effectiveness. As you come around to the back of the building, you can see those um, IPMs. You can drive in underneath to the three IPMs that are below. And as Rachel mentioned, we're showing a roof, de roof deck over those ITMs that is spilling out from the main conference room. It's meant to be used by staff for uh, lunch or meetings or when there are occasional um, networking events. Uh, they may have people out on that, those, that deck, but it would be limited um, mostly during day hours, mostly for staff um, and a couple times a year would guests be invited to use that deck. Um, and then as you leave the site on the west side of the building, as Rachel was saying, there's some really nice birch trees on the staff entrance is tucked in the back uh, corner here, um, so private and secure. And I'll bring you inside on the floor plans. So the front of the building, Route 9, can you see my cursor? Can people see my cursor? Yes. Okay, good. Um, this is that pergola that's out front. There's a vestibule with two ITMs as you come in, and that vestibule will be uh, open for use of the ITMs or ATMs 24-7, uh, but this door obviously locked into the main bank area. As you come in, there's a uh, concierge desk or a greeter's desk and then walking through into an open lobby space, which has an open um, area up to the second floor above. There are offices that are ringing that area. It's very similar to what their um, current branch is like at Westgate. Um, and at the back, there are two teller pods as well as a, a booth, a private booth teller station um, and safe deposit, uh, public bathrooms, and then uh, the private secure uh, areas for staff. There's a back stair. This is the staff entry. Um, it is used as also as an emergency egress. And um, as Rachel noted, it is an accessible entry and egress. Um, and the, there is a accessible parking space for a staff person at that location. The second floor is primarily for staff or for appointment only um, engagement with members. Uh, someone would come up the stairs and land at this landing, which can be used as a waiting area or an informal 
um, uh, meeting space. And there's also an elevator from the first floor, just as you come in the entry, it opens out onto both sides. This is a, a loop around that open area down to the first floor. Again, offices on either side. The back has the large conference or community room that spills out onto that roof deck. There's a big break room, a couple of bathrooms, and again, that um, back stair, of course, a janitor's closet. This is a section uh, through the building, just kind of giving you an idea of uh, that relationship between the first floor. So all the way over to the right is that vestibule where the ITMs are. You come into that uh, greeter space, the greeters here, that's the elevator tower. Upstairs is that informal um, meeting or waiting space. This is the uh, mezzanine sort of wrapping around the first floor, the offices up above. This is the teller station in the back, um, the teller pods, and then the community room and filling out onto that uh, deck with the ITM below. This is an image of what it's like to walk in. You'd meet the greeter, you'd see the teller pods beyond the offices. To your left would be that open stair with some plantings, another informal waiting space. As you walk through that open uh, waiting space, you can see up to the second floor, to the community room and the offices above and to the teller pods in front of you. Um, displays of art and community artwork is important. And so there are places where we've identified uh, to share that in the waiting areas. And then as you're leaving or turning around to leave the building, looking back towards the front, um, that's the vestibule at the very end, the large glassy area to the front, the elevator tower above. And you can see in this image some of that exposed wood structure that we're um, proposing. As you come up to the stairs on the second floor level, this is looking back towards the conference room and you can see down to the first floor level. And here's that conference room and you can see the uh, roof deck beyond and then looking back from the conference room towards the front of the building. Now I turn it back to Tom. Do you want me to leave this up or you want me to take this down? Yeah, I, I, I think that's great. Uh, thanks very much, Elon. Um, Mr. Chair, if you wanna talk site or architecture, now would probably be a good time for us to, to chat. Okay. Um, why don't we bring the site drawings back up? I don't know if that's Rachel. Yes. Um, so board members, uh, I guess, prepare your questions or comments if you have any. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, so a couple of quick site ones. Um, I did not go to the visit. Um, oh, the... yeah. Well, actually, good point. Why do we do the site? the site visit report first. Sure. And uh, I know there were two or three members of our board that were there. Uh, who would like to make that report? Johanna. I always get nervous doing this, but I can take a crack at it. So we met Rachel and um, one other representative at the site. Um, we started near the green sleeves corner and then walked around the garage and the warehouse to the back and um, you know, looked at essentially where the gravel part drops off. And then there's kind of a, a lower vegetated area we poked around the back of the warehouse and looked at the residence that's there that um, will be before the historic commission in June. Um, and then we looped back around to the front and talked a lot about the entrance and egress and the rain garden. Um, it was very helpful to see the site. At one point we had a brief visit with the owner of the garage um, who's gonna be moving his business to the Fort Hill Auto Body Shop on Route 9 on the south side of, or sorry, the east side of uh, Amherst College. Um, 
I think that's it. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add. All right, thanks, Johanna. Janet, would you like to add? Sure. Um, it, it, things I think we talked about were the permeable pavement, which was exciting for at least me, I'm sure everybody else, um, that the, the pavement, you know, will take the rainwater, the site is not, you know, sitting like a foot above the groundwater, so that's possible. And then um, also we, I, it was really noisy in the front, like where those people are standing and sitting um, from traffic, but particularly from the car wash, it was just sort of incessantly noisy. When you go to the back of the building, it's really quiet. And um, the Arborvitae are like a complete screen. You could not even see the apartments next door. Um, it, um, I think Rachel noted that the roof garden, they're, they're building the deck strong enough so they could do like a green garden on there at some point. And um, I think that's about it for me to add. And All right. Tom? Yeah, no, that was about it. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about the house um, that is on the site, the residence and its current state and what, um, um, how it will be up for review by the historic board, but um, um, there was some commentary about that as well. All right, very good. Andrew, why don't we come back to you? Thanks. Next site questions. Okay, yeah. Um, the first, so just seeing how you've sort of reversed the, the, in, the, the entry point and the egress, I was just wondering, and I, I understand the logic behind it. Um, is, is does the amount of vegetation impact your sight lines from the egress? I couldn't uh, tell. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is that, no. is that OK, sorry. Um, there will be some, some trimming that takes place. So one of the things that the arborist identified, zoom in real close here, uh, there are three trees that are growing together as one dense mass. Uh, one is a hickory. I think one, one was a Norway maple. Um, and he recommended that we actually take them down. Um, and the neighbors were okay, okay with that also. We're going to keep one of the three trees in the stand and then prune this up so that as you are leaving the site, at the exit and you're queuing up here. I'm so sorry. Um, as your car queues up here, you have those trees are back back at this location. So with, with that removal and the pruning, we're gonna open up really good sight lines for people that are leaving the exit area. Provided also you can move the bus. Is it a bus shelter? No, it's it's just a it's pole. just a sign. Yeah, okay. and the existing sidewalk is bituminous, and there's a little concrete pad where the PBTA bus stop is now, um, and we will be providing a shelter, um, a covered shelter in this area. Okay. Um, a couple other just quick ones is, what's the snow removal plan? Um, we had provided they provided this plan with a submission package. Um, first, I will say that what we've seen with in, uh, with porous asphalt is that uh, the snow removal and winter management is, is a lot easier um, just because the sheer fact that the water permeates into the lower layers. And so you have much less standing water on the surface of the pavement. So what we're anticipating is a reduction in the amount of salt that's needed for the site as well as the amount of plowing that's needed but we will need to plow on those heavier snow events we do have some areas uh, where snow may be stored um, but we also got comment from the conservation commission that they they do not want snow stockpiled in these areas so we'll, um, umass 5 will be working working to manage the site to keep to keep it clear and open to keep the drives open um, and that may be you know, looking at if there are spaces that are not being used for parking, that maybe that's where snow gets stockpiled. Um, and as a last resort, removing snow from the site if they need to. Okay, yeah, and that, so that actually tied in with my first one is just that on the western edge of the property that that, if that is a spot where you're putting snow, that that also seems like it would impact the sight lines. 
Um, so if that if if the plan is to not use that, that seems reasonable. But I, I would certainly not want to see a snowbank on the top of the page. Yeah, that's true. They're right. Um, and having never drunk, driven a plow, I, I don't know how uh, how you get the, the snow out of that. Um, the and then the other question I know you'd mentioned it was a last minute change, but just the dumpster configuration. If you opposed it, it looked like the corral was kind of hanging in the. And I couldn't quite make this out. Is like the corral door sort of hanging in the roadway there? Um, it looks like maybe it's fourteen feet. I'm just wondering if you're swinging through. Um, coming out one of the lanes, whether you might clip that dumpster, um, given that it's it's kind of a ninety degree turn. Yeah, um, I think we have about fifteen feet clear. The there the shorter the shorter gates. Um, I mean, we we can submit another diagram that shows traffic through um, if that would be helpful. I'd be curious. Yeah, yeah, I mean, also just, I mean, aesthetically too, not that that's a, a huge concern here for me, but you know, you're, as your passengers are queued up, they're, they're gonna be staring right at that dumpster. So I imagine you'll wanna do something to make it look kind of nice is, which is gonna add maybe some additional bulk to it. So. Yeah, um, yeah we're, we're proposing a six foot high cedar enclosure around, around the dumpster. Um, okay. So they'll be looking at that. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Uh, that's it for me on this part, Doug, thanks. Sure, Andrew. Uh, anybody else? Janet. So um, I, I have to say, I, I was really impressed with the thoughtfulness of this design and the sustainability features. And I just wanted to put in a pitch for the porous um, surface because when we asked, it was only 20% more, but you save money over the like 50 year life cycle. So I, I just hope everybody does that. Um, one, my, I think my biggest criticism or hope for change is the seating area. It was just inconceivable to me that people would really be sitting there given the amount of noise from the um, street from Route 9 and sort of unattractive view of Route 9. And then the loudness of um, what seemed like maybe a 24 hour operation of people vacuuming their cars. And so I, I was thinking, I, I appreciate that you've made this beautiful rain garden and you're trying to draw people in. I thought that replacing some of the benches maybe with some native shrubs and flowering shrubs would have that really pleasing entryway. People would, maybe from the street would see these, you know, medium sized shrubs and their eyes would be drawn toward, or you'd just be very happy when you walked in. I just thought the seating area was like a great idea that no one's going to use. It might just kind of look odd or be odd. Um, and so that was my probably my biggest um, issue with the, the design. I do have one quick question about the colors. It, it sounds like it's native woods and gray. Is that stone, a stone look? Because my, my packet made everything look sort of um, kind of purpley gray and pink. And so I just wondered if the colors are what we're looking at, or are they going to be different? The colors of the building um, are intended to have sort of a, a cool gray color. Mm -hmm. um, the sign is the UMass 5 <clears throat> uh, purple color. And then sort of the wood tones would be also that warm wood tone color. So it's a, a mix of cool and warm colors. Like I said, we haven't selected the materials yet. Um, they'll probably be composite siding, not necessarily wood siding. All right. Thank you, Janet. Maria. Um, thanks, everyone, for the presentation. It's exciting to get uh, improvements on our sort of entry into Amherst. I'd love that sort of whole corridor to get uh, cleaned up a little. Um, so this is a great project tonight. It's definitely doing it. Um, so I'll keep my comments to site. I guess that's where we're, we're focusing on now. Um, if you go back to the site plan, um, any one of them really is fine of the, your proposed project. Um, okay, so um, I don't know, are the hours nine to five as far as the access to the, what you keep calling the ITMs, the one, the three in the back? Um, I'm just, yeah, those three, just because, um, you know, when they're sitting there, the headlights will be going uh, west. And 
I know there are some existing trees there. So making sure that doesn't, you know, trespass because even though all your sight lighting is great and it's dark sky and it's pointing down and shielded, we should be cognizant of, you know, the cars idling and their lights. So I'm sure, you know, your landscape design has considered that, but just that, um, you know, it was hard to tell from the planting plan if um, all those trees would take care of that trespass. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that greenish one, I think maybe had some. And I, I'd like to, should I respond to your comment? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I'd like to point out that on that east side, this is actually a drive. So this is Greenleaves Drive. And then there's another island of vegetation beyond that, mm -hmm. another layer of screen. So there's a lot of layers between the okay. headlights of the cars pointing this way. And actually it's one of the advantages of this plan is that by flipping flipping the entry and coming through here, we're not, we're not really directing a lot of headlights parking at the ITM mm -hmm. and, and the neighbors here. So right. there are many layers of protection that go beyond the site. So this is a, a wooded area. Um, mm -hmm. We do have two balsam fir along the side. Um, mm -hmm. And then we do have uh, two sourwood trees, which are um, deciduous trees in that area. And then we will be adding, not, not directly up the ITM, we will be adding more here. Also, if we do rotate the dumpster, that will also be another layer of uh, oh. screening where the actual enclosure, both sides of that fencing and the dumpsters themselves will prevent the lights from the cars getting. Right, six feet high, sure. Okay, super. Um, and then the other comment was the entry from Route 9 um, is going through the visitor parking. And so, you know, how to slow those people down so that, you know, as people are crossing from the the east side to the west to get to the front door the people walking from their cars that you know people zooming in from route nine have a, a way that slows them down i don't know if you have like a a bump or something exactly yeah there's a crosswalk that's painted but you know the people coming in route nine are coming in at like you know what is that like 40 miles an hour and they got to slow down really quickly and just making sure that that pedestrian and car intersection is mediated so that there's a safe way for the what is that like 12 parking spots for those people to get across to the front door. Um, but otherwise, can I, can, I, can I jump in for that for a minute? Because I, yeah. it, it is, um, we have talked about potentially that lower portion of parking being staff parking and that the parking that's closest to the buildings um, being for um, members or guests so that, you know, when somebody's working there all day, that's where they park their car. So the guests aren't necessarily having to cross as much it's not I don't it won't it won't be marked as such but we've definitely thought a lot about how to make it safe pedestrian wise well I like that a lot better yeah that's a great idea um and then the only other thing about site stuff um yeah I love like Janet said the porous paving I really thought about um not just making it like you know durable and long lasting but that it's a real symbol for UMass about the commitment to you know greener initiatives and I think that's great especially since it's such a you know prominent site that you know really make a statement so I think it's fantastic um but those are all my site comments should I hold off on architectural Doug or yeah gonna... why don't we do that for the moment okay thank you um any any other andrew thanks just one last one um how many employees are are expected to be here at any given time just seeing the number of offices inside um i believe it's about 12 full-time employees but so ftes that doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that it's there might be um eight actual full-time employees and then eight that are half-time employees, if that makes sense. So the offices up on the upper level are not used 100% of the time. It is appointment um, by appointment. Very good, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I, had a, I had a few questions on uh, mostly on, on a site plan. I'm looking at LC111 if you wanted to turn to that. And some of these questions are not really specific to that drawing. Um, first of all, there's a sort of dark rectangle in the lower left corner. Uh, 
what is that? Yeah, that is that is a level spreader. Okay, what what is that? I saw that term on another sheet. Yeah, we, let me pull up a detail for you. Um, that shows you what what that looks like. So it is a it is a way. It's where the all of any extra stormwater that has um, that has gathered in the subsurface in the porous paving or any of the roof water that's excess that's coming being released gently back into the wetland area. Um, and it's a way that we manage the flow of water to make sure that there isn't erosion down slope of that pipe. Um, so what happens is uh, pipe, pipe out falls into this level, level lip spreader, level spreader. Um, it's basically a, a, a long depression in the ground with reinforced with stone and allows the water to, to fill in this area and then the excess water then sheet flow over a, over a curb line. So what it does is it distributes water coming from a pipe, which is really forced in one point, and it spreads it out gently across across the level lip of the spreader. Um, we've, we've used this on a lot of projects and it, and it works really well and it prevents erosion from the downstream areas. Okay, so and, and is the bottom of the swale, uh, does it percolate into the ground too? It can, it's not, it's the, a, a functional level lip spreader doesn't necessarily need to infiltrate. It just needs to hold the water and allow, allow it to spill over the top, over the top of the spillway. A lot of times it does actually infiltrate as well as evaporate and spill over. Okay. All right, uh, so let's go back to a site plan. In the southeast corner of the building, there's a pad that has a T and a G. Is that a transformer and a generator? Correct, yeah. And these are also enclosed with a, with a screening fence. OK. Um, let's see. And then um, you've talked a lot about the sustainable planting, uh, but I did see on one of maybe on the planting plan that there is some lawn. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could just clarify the extent of lawn, since I th I thought it would be great if this was so sustainable that you didn't need to bring lawn mowers in and uh, you know have those emissions from maintaining the site. Uh, we're we're using um, our lawn is actually a a, a no mow lawn mix, so it looks it looks akin to lawn. Um, it requires mowing once a year in November after the seed heads appear. Um, it takes a little bit longer to establish, and it has to be cut at a higher rate. But it 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 looks like lawn, but it, it's a much more sustainable alternative. It uses less water than regular lawn, and it's well adapted to our area. And how high does it grow? It grows to eight. It grows to eighteen inches, but its main characteristic when it reaches that mature level is it flops over, and it looks like little waves in, in the in the grass. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, so um, on, on the exiting and entrance off of Route 9, uh, having a car exiting at the same time another car might be slowing down to enter. Is there any sort of conflict between those two vehicles that's imagined since one is sort of pulling out in front of the other? Or is the traffic, uh, you know, the uh, density of traffic so small that it's not really an issue? I, I would say that um, the, the, the condition, and I'm going to answer it a different way, maybe not directly, but I could say that the condition has improved upon, upon what there exists today. Um, and the fact that, you know, we have only one, one point of exit from the site. There are two sites being combined into one. There's one point of exit instead of three points of exit as it exists today with the residents and then the two 
entries and exits for the garage. Um, this distance here is very similar to what, what happens in multiple places along Route 9. Um, so I can let Chris speak to that more or, or Tom or others on our team talk to, about this more also. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that what's unusual is that that um, conflict, which I'll put in air quotes, exists within two driveways in the same site but it's a condition that's repeated up and down Route 9. Any driveway you're exiting, you're exiting and heading toward the entry to a different property typically. Um, and then also uh, to answer this question and, and sort of address a couple of the concerns earlier is to keep in mind that because this is a state highway, we will be going through the Mass DOT highway access permit process, which includes demonstrating sufficient site distance and separation from other uh, conflicting movements. Okay, great, great. So then uh, I just had a couple of comments. Um, the first was that the bicycle location, uh, if you expect a lot of customers to come there, it might be nice if the bicycle location were covered uh, and potentially closer to the entry. Um, uh, then secondly, I noticed the sidewalk along Route 9 is dimensioned at five feet. And I wondered whether that is a requirement of DOT or whether you could be the first to make this a more pedestrian friendly environment and widen it to maybe eight feet or something like that. It, is that dictated by DOT or? Yeah, Chris, and I don't know if you want to talk about that as part of it looks to me like that's in the DOT right of way. And so that's going to be under DOT jurisdiction. Yeah, it'll certainly be entirely their discretion. Um, I think that one issue with, for instance, an eight foot sidewalk here is that um, either we'd be widening it toward the road and putting the edge of the sidewalk that much closer to the fast moving traffic, or we'd be widening it into the site. And then you've got a situation where DOT owns five feet of the sidewalk and we own three feet of it. And my suspicion is they would not necessarily like that. Um, but it's certainly, we have, we have multiple rounds of reviews with them. So it's certainly something that we could uh, discuss, but uh, my strong suspicion is that they'll want to keep the, keep the standard and consistent with the width uh, up and down until they themselves come through and and change everything. Okay. Uh, and then the third one was uh, regarding the bus, the bus stop. Uh, do you expect that that will eventually be a pull off for the bus to get out of the traffic way? Uh, or is it gonna just stay where the bus is slowing down in, in, the, in the travel lane? So that's, I mean, totally up to PVTA. I, I think our expectation is that it remains just as it is and not a complete pull off. So uh, if it became a pull off, uh, would a pull off be long enough that it needed to extend into the adjacent property or is there enough room here with it? I, I don't know, you know, whether they care, whether they're, uh, you know, affecting two properties or one, but it looks like it's pretty narrow. You know, it's not a very long distance if you were going to try to do it all within one property. My sense is that they would have to extend it onto a second property, but it's likely, and Rachel, I don't know if you have an existing conditions plan to show where the existing bus concrete pad is. Um, so that's where we're talking about right now, Mr. Chair. And so if they were gonna do a pull off there, given the proximity to the Green Leaves Drive, they're probably already looking at impacting two properties. Because if they were to go back further, then you know that's quite close to that Green Leaves Drive. So okay. um, up to PVTA though. All right. Um, all right, I don't have any more questions. Um, maybe we should go on to the architectural drawings. Would you like me to share my screen again? Yes, please. Yeah. 
you see that? Yep. All right, board members, any any comments or questions about the architecture of the project? Maria. Thanks, Beth. Um, I did not have time to read all 166 pages. What are the hours of operation as far as employees coming to this building? Is it nine to five? Nine, nine to five, Monday through Friday. And then I believe it's nine to noon on, or wine, one o'clock on Saturdays. No. And then the yeah. ITM is 24 seven or no? No, the ITM, so the ITM is where there's an actual teller that you can contact and they will be available till 6 p.m. And then after 6 p.m. it's just a regular ATM. But so an ATM is available 24 seven, 365. Okay. Okay, so the lights um, on the front will definitely be on all the time, but maybe not necessarily, or are all the lights gonna be on even after the, business? The site lighting will be on, um, you know, for safety and security because the, the ATMs or ITMs in the back will also be available. So all the, all, everything that's an ATM becomes an, an Everything that's an ITM becomes an ATM after 6 p.m., if that makes sense. Okay. So you can either drive through or you can park and go to the vestibule. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. That was kind of more of a site thing I forgot to ask. Um, well, going back to my sort of earlier thing about the, the whole symbol and everything, I, I, I love this building. I, I hope it gets built and not Valley Engineer too badly. Um, and I really appreciate all the, you know, um, putting solar and attempting to hit net zero. and um, uh oh what well, i wrote it down um the only thing i would maybe suggest architecturally not that planning board really i don't know if we have purview on it but just that um on that south side where that really cool roof terrace is uh, maybe there's more opportunity for more pvs if you provide shading because that's going to be a really hot terrace especially with their weather lately um like I, I don't know that i would hang out out there on that bright open uh exposed space so maybe there's more opportunity for um pv similar to the way you guys have shaded a lot of parking and um not not saying to cover the whole thing and you know um those those panels but um but yeah i really appreciate the sort of risk and the sort of um looking forward sort of aspect of the architecture right i really um i think hopefully it will set a trend and help things sort of um, um tie together better at that whole corner um with you guys already doing the other building closer to um, University Drive. Um, I kind of agree with Janet that, you know, don't build something that no one's going to occupy. And so, you know, the pergola looks great. It really marks the front entry. And I wonder if there's a different way to animate the front, whether it's through planting instead of places where people might occupy or might not occupy. Um, so I guess, you know, that that's a really good sort of comment about will people really use it and um if i if it were me i probably would hang out on that roof terrace and have my lunch back there where it's more quiet and as long as it wasn't you know 95 degrees and um you're in complete sun um so anyways i i, I really appreciate the building and the risks it's taking as far as just being really um modern and uh i i hope that uh yeah it stays pretty close to the rendering it looks fantastic and um and i yeah i really like that all the uh sort of uh, thought toward, um, you know, it's not, it, I mean, it, even if it gets value engineered out, it, I can tell you, you know, your intentions are like, we're going to keep pushing as much of it as we can, because this is a statement for UMass. So, um, yeah, so really appreciate that. Um, I think that's it. I think that's all I have for architecture. Thank, yeah. thank you, Maria. Um, we have definitely thought about that Southern exposure on that rooftop. And as Rachel may have mentioned, our hope Again, you mentioned value engineering. Um, our hope is that eventually we are designing it so that it can have plants and, and potentially even trees someday um, to provide some of that shading. But the idea of maybe a, a solar pergola back there is also uh, an idea that we'll discuss with UMass Bud. All right. Thanks, Maria. Tom. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for the presentation and uh, like Maria, I appreciate your building um, quite a bit and I like the um, the double height space. I think it's a really you know well executed experience inside there. So 
Um, I applaud all of that. And I really do enjoy the, the back balcony as well as the private space. I'm going to have to agree with, um, um, with my colleagues about that front space um, from the site visit. The whistling and howling of the site exposure to the car wash it was really, really hard to even hear people talk. And so I'm just wondering if there's a way to kind of maybe, I mean, and I appreciate the values, right? This is about building community. This is it's about sustainability. It's about all those things and it's showcased here. But I think, you know, if those seating areas are kind of pushed back more close to the building um, along this kind of left side here, um, and then maybe there was some low shrubbery or something that could actually block some of that sound um, so that might feel a little bit more intimate and a little less exposed. I think people might actually sit there. People, you know, people who work there might go out there for a break. Um, but I think right now it's so exposed and the noise pollution is so immense um, that I, I think it's it's not serving you very well to, to use it for just seating when I think it could be wonderful opportunity for plantings and other things to really showcase the values of UMass 5 while, while finding maybe a potentially slightly more secluded spot or build some seclusion for that um, particular seating area. So just my thoughts on that. Thanks, Tom. Um, that, that is more site related, but I value what you all experienced there. And I think it's certainly something we would uh, review with UMass 5. I don't, Rachel, do you have any comments or thoughts about that? I do say I did, didn't really go into a lot of detail about the planting plan, but we, we do have a lot of shrubs um, integrated in that arrival pathway experience. And we were playing, and I also didn't explain, we we're playing with some of the grades along the side to again create more enclosure on the, on the east side. Um, so we are we are trying to do what we can um, to, to to showcase plants and make it a really lovely experience uh, along the way. And I think even if we do remove the seating area, having the Goshen stone walls as a reference to our area um, and as a figure and a way to ground the building is really important visually, and um, also to create that separation and clarify where the rain garden is and where the walking spaces are. So. I, I do think that the design can still hold its own and achieve all that you guys are pointing out and talking about, even if it's not used for seating. I think it still works really well. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. Johanna. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanna echo that I appreciate a lot of the sustainability elements of it from the on-site solar to the really thoughtful stormwater and just water management plan, the impervious surfaces, the native plantings. Um, there's just a lot of really thoughtful work that goes into this. One question that arose for me as I was looking at the images was just um, how much great daylighting there's gonna be in the building. And it made me wonder how you're planning on dealing with bird strikes on all these wonderful glass windows, or if they're, you know, what kind of consideration or factors you're taking into account there. Um, thank you for that. Uh, yes, we, well, on the east and west side, we have um, solar fins on the windows. So in the office areas, um, that'll cut down on glare into the offices, but also obviously hopefully not confuse the birds. Um, your point is well taken on the, the north facing, um, front facing, and we have discussed that. Uh, there are things that you can do with the glass um, uh, so that birds are not confused by it. And it is something that we, will, we have discussed and will take into consideration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chris. I have a question and it's really more of a curiosity, which is inside the building on the second floor, you have some rooms that are labeled hotel. And what does that mean? The staff have to stay overnight sometimes. No, 
<laughs> the telling is a term that's used when it is actually sort of a, a touchdown space. So it's not designated to any specific employee, but it's a place where, um, you know, sometimes they have auditors that come in. Um, sometimes there's some, a staff member that's usually located somewhere else that needs to spend the day there. So it's a it's a touchdown space, much like a hotel is a touchdown space. Thank you. Well, since we're on the on the uh, subject of room names, I will ask about the rooms next door, which are Cuso. What does that mean? Oh boy, I knew somebody was going to ask me that question, and um, uh, anybody remember? It's so it's insurance. It's an acronym. Um, I'm looking to see if somebody is sending me credit union service organization. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a company that services credit unions exclusively. That's coming from uh, UMass 5. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is, I think, also not in the purview of planning board, but I will say that I was a little bit, I guess, misled by the use of the term community room uh, by the way you described it, where it's basically a room for the staff uh, and very rarely would be a community space. Um, is that? I, mean, well, I, would, I guess the way that I would phrase it is that on a day-to-day basis it's for staff but uh, community organizations could use it through the credit union um, so maybe it, after hours uh, yeah I think I think what I was starting to be concerned about was the segregation of the public from banking spaces uh, when the community came and used that room um, you know, we did, we reviewed a, a library proposal uh, from your office for the North Amherst Library a, a year or so ago, where the community room was right off the main entrance. So you could have the main entrance and the community room open at the same time you were, you did not have access to the library. And so if this were a community room that was gonna be used after hours, uh, I would think that the, the bank might want to be able to segregate the public and keep them out of the banking spaces when bit, very little of their staff was there. Yeah, so we did, we did um, let me get to the floor plans. Uh, give me a second here. Um, we have thought about that and there are, we're proposing that there will be security screens that uh, or gates that roll down from the ceiling and block off this lobby space. So uh, someone coming in after hours would be able to use the elevator or the stairs. We'd also have a security um, screen that comes down right in front of the ITM area. So if anyone decided to catapult over the railing down into the lobby, they're, they're basically stuck in this space. Um, yeah, so that is a good point, and we did think about that. Um, and so we are trying to make it secure but accessible. We really felt it was important, you know, on that second floor level to be able to see the community room um, so that people know that, that, you know, there might be trainings there or um, there might be community events like an Arrive at Five or... Uh, an organization might use it as a board meeting place and, and having access to that deck, um, just we really wanted to use that. The ITMs are located at the back of the building for pre precisely the reason you talked about in terms of noise at the front, we wanted to block the Route 9 noise as much as possible. So good. yes, we've thought about it and I understand what you're talking about. Okay, all right, uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I um, a, a, just a thought and wasn't sure who would be the best person to answer this, but you know, with with the current layout, with the canopy and the ITMs in the back, are there any 
additional like security precautions that are made just for customer safety? Um, if you know you're back there after hours, can you can you be seen from the road at all? Or it is. Uh, so I don't have the site plan. It is slightly at an angle. I mean, certainly you are shielded from the road at some point. There will it will be well lit. There will be cameras in those locations for security. Okay. But I'm I'm not sure that even somebody going by on Route Nine would notice if something was happening on the side of the building necessarily. So I think the cameras and the lighting is what makes it secure. All right. I had sort of a similar reaction to the floor plan on the first floor, which had no windows on the south side of the building. Um, and, and given the way you've done the circulation um, and, and that there is no actual drive up teller window. So, you know, just the fact that there are no windows on that end, uh, just made me sort of wonder how secure I would feel about doing my banking back there uh, without anybody available to, to see if I had a problem. Well, uh, the ITMs are people, um, much like we're having a discussion right here, there would be a person in those boxes speaking to you. Um, and there aren't any windows on the south side because that is primarily the mechanical spaces, the IT. Um, there is a, a workroom space where cash is handled, so, and the bathroom and the stair. There's no need for um, windows there. Uh, and so the, the teller, it, it is not the traditional teller window that you are used to going to. It doesn't work with that circulation loop to have a teller in that location. Right, right. Okay, all right. Um, any other comments from any of the members of the board? If not, we'll go on to public comment. And I guess I guess I just wanted to add to that that if you weren't comfortable going to the ITMs at night, um, you can always park and go to the vestibule ITMs or ATMs at the front, which will be very well lit and very visible from Route 9. Great, thank you. I, I will also say I appreciated the, the completeness of the site drawings and, uh, and the architectural drawings. Uh, you gave us a, a really effective uh, picture of, of the project. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that would like to make a public comment in this hearing? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, Chris, uh, have we received uh, the, any, all the feedback from all the other town departments so that might need to comment on this? Uh, are we in a position to vote and close this hearing this evening or do we really need to continue it? I think you're in a position to vote and close it. I think you've received com comments from the town engineer and from the fire department, but I would like to ask my colleague, Nate Malloy, uh, to confirm that. Okay, Nate. Sure, yeah, you know, the Conservation Commission will issue the order of conditions and, you know, um, the town engineer and fire have looked at it and provided comments. I will say in the development application report, I did call attention to the size of the monument sign is, is larger than it, um, you know, than the bylaw allows. So there'll have to be a waiver requested there or granted for the size of the sign. Um, and then the, you know, interestingly enough with the new dumpster location, there is a, you know, there's was a retaining wall with a six foot fence on top. And so the effective height was, um, you know, say at one point it was about 10 feet, about, you know, maybe six or seven feet from the property line. So there needed to be um, again, a modification of that setback um, you know, with through 6.29, given that the building commissioner would, you know, because the, fe the, the fence is really right on top of the retaining wall. So we're considering that, you know, one structure in terms of height within the setback. And so um, maybe that's changed given the new dumpster location that the overall height um, meets, you know, the, 
you know, that dimensional standard, but um, no, I think everything else is all right. You know, um, I, I do think that, you know, in my application report, there were, you know, some questions about the amount of screening to Hawkins Meadow and if there is sufficient screening for car headlights or after hour use, or if the, you know, how much illumination is, is being provided over the ITMs and ATMs at night. And so, um, you know, the hedge isn't on their property. You know, it's like there are a few sh shade trees planted along that edge, but, um, you know, I just really want to make sure that that's, you know, there's sufficient screening there. I think that's about, about it. Okay. So would the uh, conditions or do, do we have the conditions drafted? We do. All right. Um, maybe we should. May I just say you have findings and conditions drafted um, by, by Nate. So he may want to walk you through those. Yeah, I think we're going to want to do that, Janet. Um, and and at some point, if we're going to, and uh, we may want to take a break. Um, go ahead, Janet. So I was wondering about the snow storage issue that Andrew had raised earlier because that wasn't really answered. Um, I think I'd be interested in hearing what the Conservation Commission says, especially if it changes how the site is used. And then I haven't read the draft conditions at all, and so I don't know if. It seems like if we start going through that, including some of the things that the town engineer, I don't know if they're in the draft conditions, he seems to have a lot of comments. And so I just put that out there. Um, and then also I'd, I'd like to look at the lighting around the ATM just to see, I didn't really pay attention to whether light would be going to Hawkins Meadow or what, so. Yeah, I mean, one question I had, which wasn't answered is, you know, sometimes on drive throughs they have like a marquee sign, you know, whether it's like just a symbols of green check or, you know, green, red, yellow, just to let you know that it's open, you know, LED signs. And I don't, I don't know if that's, if that's, um, you know, it wasn't mentioned or, you know, what kind of signage there might be to say that the lane is open or closed or, you know, and how bright that would be if it was on 24 hours a day, but is there something proposed along e above each drive aisle to indicate, or is it just, you know, it's always open, I guess, or always on. Correct. Yep. No, no LED signage. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't find out if it was out of order until you got up to it. Correct. Okay. We'll try to all out of order. Oh. Road cones are always an option. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Janet, is your hand a legacy or? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, how do, how do folks feel? Do you want to continue through this, uh, the findings and conditions this evening, or would you like to do that at a, at a later meeting? I'm not seeing any, any uh, volunteers to respond to that. Uh, Tom. I, mean, I think it depends on what we still have in the agenda, because a lot of times reading through all of those things can take quite an epic amount of time, um, especially if there are subtle word changes or um, amendments that are made throughout that process. So um, I think it's a, it's a question about um, how, how much time we wanna to dedicate to it and, and um, whether or not there's a, an immediate rush to make sure that this gets approved prior to our next meeting. Well, the, the primary thing left on our agenda is the site plan review and special permit for the, the other project on Main Street. And we do have members of that team waiting in the wings for their presentation. Um, and so, I, I mean, I guess I'm inclined to think we should probably uh, stop for this evening uh, or sometime soon and continue this hearing to a later date. Uh, maybe when we can get, we can all review the findings and conditions a little bit more. And um, Mr. Ch yes, for our, from our perspective, yeah, I, I think um, you know, we're on, we're, we're under agreement. We've got certain contingencies we need to make, but we also wanna be respectful of, of your time. We gave you a lot of information this evening. We don't want you to rush it. Um, 
I think we we see where this is going. So I guess we would have two requests if we were going to continue, maybe three requests. One, hopefully to that first June meeting that you have. Um, second, uh, let us know tonight if there's anything else that, that we need to provide to you in order to get an approval. And then third, if you are going to approve it at that meeting, just to turn around the decision as, as soon as possible thereafter. And I think, you know, Nate and Chris have done a great job of preparing the findings and the conditions. So I think to actually put it into a decision won't, won't be that much, but that's not my work to do. It's theirs. So I just want to be respectful of all that. So that would, if, if it's something that the, the um, board would like to do is to continue it, I think, you know, with those things in mind, we'd be fine with it. Okay. Uh, Chris, what do we have on the agenda for the beginning of June? For the beginning of June, Mark, uh, June 1st, you have um, flood mapping, which is kind of a big thing, but I'm not sure how much detail you want to get into on that. Um, then we have Ron Laverdier with a kind of a small change to a property on West Street. Um, he's presenting his entire site plan because it's necessary to show it to you, but I don't think the changes are significant. And then you have the um, Mr. Robleski's subdivision plan, which was coming back before you on June 1st, um, which does have a lot of detail related to it. So, um, so those are the three things, flood mapping around the Verdier small project and the center east way subdivision plan. Right. right. And, and we're also gonna be talking this evening about Mr. Uh, Robleski's Main Street project. That's right. Uh, yep. Kind of separately from the subdivision plan. And I think there's a good chance that's gonna come back too. Mm -hmm. I think if you were just reviewing um, findings and conditions that night, mm -hmm. maybe you know, getting some small amount of information that might be additional that the applicant wanted to submit that you could get through it on June 1st. Okay, I think I, I mean, how does the board feel? Uh, I think I'm inclined to continue this evening. I think we should be clear with Tom and his, his group about what else we want. Um, and that includes what the staff wants as well as what the board wants. So maybe you could ask Nate if he feels that there's any yeah. further information that needs to be um, submitted. Sure. So, you know, I can, I'll run down the notes that, you know, was, you know, the, you know, board members mentioned, and then I can just go over some of my questions. You know, we had, you know, it can be either a condition or it could be if it's ready for next meeting, you know, new plantings along the green leaves um, property line, um, you know, plans for the back deck, both in terms of planting or use. I do think, you know, if the community room and the deck are used publicly, or for events, it could impact parking or it could impact noise or light if after hours. So, I mean, you know, some clarity there. Um, you know, I, I'm still, you know, I'm still curious to know about like how that evergreen hedge would be maintained or if UMass 5 could have an agreement with Hawkins Meadow just because it is not on their property, but it is really significant right now. Um, um, is snow removal, uh... You know, it sounded like that was kind of in flux from the Conservation Commission. Well, I was thinking that that could be achieved without changes to the site, but perhaps we can leave that up to the applicants. Um, or in the in the management plan. Plan, right? Because you know, it could be just that it could also be trucked and removed as necessary, right? So there's some snow storage remove areas, and then it just is, you know, hauled off site if if necessary. Um, right. Rachel had mentioned that. You know, I think. You know, the permeable pavement's great. One of the conditions were, was that it would be maintained in an annual report submitted. I mean, because it's not supposed to be sanded. It needs to be vacuumed twice a year. Um, you know, so it, it works if it's maintained. Um, so that, you know, possibly would be a condition. Um, you know, perhaps traffic calming when entering, but that's not um, perhaps necessary. I mean, I like the idea of maybe moving the, the staff parking. So I don't know if that needs to be formalized, you know, to that east side. Um, you know, I, I still think the lighting, whether that could be dimmed or, you know, some explanation of whether, you know, 
is, is there, it could it be dimmed at 11 or, you know, how, how does that site lighting work after hours? If there's any changes to the front, you know, there's a, a number of comments about that the front may not be used for seating. So is, you know, would that really be changed in terms of a site design uh, with plantings and then, um, you know, the bike location. So it, would that be moved to the front or have be a, uh, you know, have a, a shelter cover to it. So, you know, those are the comments from the board, uh, kind of a summary of those. I see there's hands. I'm gonna say for my comments, just, you know, we need to just clarify the distance of the dumpster location to the side yard setback. I think it was noted on a plan, but not, I didn't see that distance. Um, and I think that's, you know, they covered most everything else. All right. Uh, the uh, findings and conditions that have been drafted, I didn't see those in my packet. Did those come as a later email that I didn't open before this meeting? Yes. Okay. Those came as an email today, I think in the middle of the day. Is that right, Nate? Or was it yesterday? I can't remember if it was there oh. yesterday. <laughs> Might okay. have been yesterday. All right, so we can all look for those. Mm -hmm. um, so, Elon, I'll call on you. You may have some sort of responses to those that list. Uh, the only one I, I just wanted a little more uh, clarification on is the use of the deck, and um, but so we can specifically respond to that. You know, after hours might be two, three, four times a year, and wouldn't ever go past like eight or nine p.m. at night. What specifically do you want as a response regarding that? Well, sure. Like, for, for instance, is it associated with the UMass Five College Credit Union, or would it be, you know, could it be an outside organization that's renting it for an event, but somehow associated with the bank, you know, or credit union? So, or is it just, you know, anyone could, you know, for instance, like a nonprofit could hold a fundraiser event there that isn't somehow related to the credit union? So, you know, that I guess you know, kind of more of the programmatic element of it. Um, you know, okay, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll we'll review that. But my understanding is that there will always be someone from the credit union on site when the building is in use. So it's not like it would just be open to the public without sure. uh, representative there. Sure. My my thought would be just you know in terms of noise or other things for the neighbors. You know if they're you know having a condition about right it's um you know how whether it's there's an end time or how it's used in terms of you know it's an it's considered an office use right the zoning category these categories office use so just how that those two interact um and okay. and it could impact parking if you were right. you know if you had if you filled that community room and the deck with people standing you could have probably 100 people in there uh, yes, and, and we've talked about that with UMass Five, and they would be providing a shuttle service from their Westgate location, which has um, much more parking. Rachel, were you going to chime in about that? That's exactly the same thing. Yeah. All right. So, so maybe. So are those types of responses acceptable? And and I think they probably ought to go into the management plan, because um, okay. that's kind of where the where the bank. Uh, essentially commits to sort of the conditions of the operation of the property. Right, so a revised management plan. No, I, I think that's good, Doug, right? So if there's an end time to the event or parking overflow or potential conflict with banking hours, right? Or maximum okay. occupancy of an event. Um, okay, that's helpful, thank you. All right, Janet. Um, I just I wanted to add um, in terms of you know things to consider is I Jason Skills had a long list of items I'm not sure if they made their way into the conditions or into changes in the plans so I, I, he has like a May 11th letter um, also I think the community space can actually be a very positive thing especially for the different apartment complexes nearby they may not have that kind of space for themselves. Um, Maybe for traffic calming, a change in surface as you come off of Route 9 and it's kind of bumpier and you kind of automatically slow like cobbles or something. And then also, I am interested in the dimming of the lights at night because I can, I'm sure it's not going to be looking like, you know, um, an air, you know, a spacecraft going up into the air, but I would think, especially near the wetland in the ATM area, you could just, I could see a million moths coming in or animals coming off the wetland. 
Um, you want it safe, but you know, if your lights are on all night, it's not good for the animals. And I'm sure the people next door may be noticing that and, and things like that. So just those are my ads also on behalf of Jason Skills. All right, thanks, Janet. You know, one thing we didn't discuss was all the signs. You know, there's the, you know, the, the kind of commercial signs, you know, so there's the monument sign and then the signs on the building. And then there's a number of site signs, right? You know, entry, exit, HP parking, a number of those. And so, you know, it looks like a lot of those signs are um, illuminated from within, right? So the entry and exit signs and some others. And so I, you know, it was in the packet and it was discussed in the re development application report, but it wasn't discussed much tonight. So I don't know if there's any comments or questions about that, but. Yeah, Tom, and we can, we can run through that if you want. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I don't know how many people from your team you would want to bring back uh, at the beginning of June, but it, it might be helpful if we went through it tonight. So if everybody can see my screen, we've got um, the site, which we're familiar with right now, along with the proposed signage. So you've got entrance sign, directional sign, directional sign, uh, ATM video teller and clearance signs above the ITM ATM, directional sign, which may be relocated depending upon where the, the dumpster enclosure actually gets located. Uh, and then another uh, directional sign along with a, a do not enter and a no left turn. Um, and also another do not enter and a stop sign here. So for traffic signals and then a not an exit sign on this side, just so folks who by whatever reason back out of this parking space think they can come out this way, um, they would have that not an exit sign here. You've got the building signage. And so you've got a backlit sign at the top of the building that was shown on the renderings. I think that's 50 square feet, so that's compliant. You also have this uh, mission statement sign, the one that's going to be externally illuminated that Elon mentioned, you know, the, the I'll call it a can is gonna be up in this pergola shining down onto the, the uh, mission statement. Uh, I think that's about 28 square feet. Then I'll skip down to the monument sign. And so in, in Rachel, I may ask that you get the site plan back up so we can show the, um, the monument sign uh, in relation to the traveled way. But a lot of the comments that we heard tonight, I think you know Maria had brought it up. I think Andrew had brought something up about just sight line, sight distance, traveling, uh, speed of travel on the public way. So one of the things that, that we thought was important was to get a sign that fit into the neighborhood um, but was pulled up a little closer to the street, not, not right on the property line, but closer to the street so that uh, the motoring public would be able to know what's there and then where the entrance is. So we're proposing a 60 square foot sign. That's about uh, seven and a half feet high, I think. Um, with this nice stone base um, and stone backing. And then you've got that, you know, it shows is probably a little bit brighter purple here. Um, and I think only the letters here are what is going to be illuminated uh, at night. It's not the whole backing. It's just those letters that are illuminated. And, and what I'll do is I will, well, I can stay on here if you have questions specifically about the signage, but I'll turn it to Rachel to show the, the, the location of the sign um, because it was all thought out in, in, you know, that initial scoping analysis they did. All right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Chris, I had seen your hand until just a moment ago. Um, my question has been answered. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, Rachel. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, this is the location of the monument sign. So that as you're coming down Route 9, um, you have time to see it and know that you are that you've arrived and you have time to turn in. Um, and then the comment about this the setback for the fence, the setback from the fence uh, is, is uh, shown on the plan that we that we have 
So the fence is in this plan is 7.67 feet setback um, for that 9.73 foot tall wall plus fence overall height um, with the wall being 3.73 feet. And even if we rotated it, it's likely that it would still, because I think in that, that future condition and before we come back, I will probably have that location uh, in the plan showing the side yard setback distance. I didn't see that uh, pave the area of pavement changing in the revised condition for the dumpster. So I would expect we do still need that, that waiver. All right. All right, so um, does anybody want to make a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, Elon. I, I just wanted to add, and um, if I can quickly share my screen, in terms of, I know one of the questions that came up was context. And uh, I quickly zoomed through what you experience as you're coming down Route 9. And you can see over on the, the left side of my screen is the FL Roberts sign, which is about, so we have an intern who went out and measured all the signs surrounding this area. And that one is about 78 square feet. And the proposed uh, sign, I think, was about 61 square feet. So just for context, it is at least balanced on both sides of the street. Thank you. All right. Um, we, does anybody have a motion to continue the hearing to uh, June 1st? Chris, do you have a date or do you have a time we should put in there? Yes, I think you should put in um, 7.15. I think the... Um, Mr. Robleski is coming back at 735, then we have flood mapping at 745, and we have Round the Verdier at, excuse me, 645, and Round the Verdier at 7. So if you said 715 or 730, that'll probably be fine. All right, so we need a motion to continue the hearing to, is it June 1st at 715? Yep. PM. Tom. So moved. Andrew. So seconded. Thank you both. And uh, thank you, Tom and uh, Rachel and Elon and your teams for being with us. And we'll hope to see some of you in on June 1st. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot. We All need right. to vote. Need to vote. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so board, shall we vote on our continuation? Maria? Yes, approved. And Tom? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Uh, looks like we've lost Johanna. Well, I'll vote aye. And um, Johanna was absent. Do we know, just for point of clarification, do we know when she dropped off? I'm just thinking of quorum, her ability to vote at the next hearing, Mullins rule, all of those things. So maybe if we could just see if she heard all of the substance then she would still qualify to vote at the next well she certainly made comments uh fairly far into your presentation uh, but of course the, the the recording will tell us exactly where she dropped off perfect okay i think Thank she you. probably heard enough to vote great you might guess but pam and i will put our heads together and figure out the time okay um board members uh, the time is 8.56. Why don't we take a five-minute break? We're only running one hour behind our usual break. Uh, and uh, we'll see you back at one minute after nine. Please mute and turn off your camera.
Johanna, you're back. We, we noticed you left. I am back. Sorry about that. I had to sing my kids' songs. Well, we thought you didn't leave very long ago. I sent you and Chris an email so that we have the timestamp for. Oh, okay. Then, um, I should, then let me look at my email. Aha, uh -huh, mm -hmm. 851. So that was only 10 minutes ago. I'm a fast singer. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, we wanted to be sure you heard enough of that earlier presentation that you can continue and vote on the final approval. But that seems like it was, was plenty of participate participation to qualify. Great. And we were all supposed to come back from break at 9.01. So here we are. Yeah. I'm going to start moving the other folks in for the next public hearing. OK, Mr. Marshall? Yes, that'd be great. Mr. Reedy, was such a surprise. Um, I'm unable to start my video, but I think I can speak. Uh, we can hear you, Janet. And are you able to see all of us? I can see everybody but Andrew, Nate, and. Um... Yeah, and you can see you can see the screen. You'll be able to see when people share screen. Yeah, but where did I go? <laughs> Well, I've had trouble with my video at work lately, and it seems to be just where the camera plugs into the laptop. I'm back. Um, I'm back. There you are. OK, good. I think I hit the wrong button. OK. I left it when I instead of, I don't know. Could be fine. All right. Uh, so we're waiting on Andrew. Chris, uh, is, is Nate involved in this one? I saw you shake your head, but you're muted. So I'll assume the answer is we could start. Well, you can start without Nate. Yep. OK. And I see Andrew's back, so we're all here. OK, so the time, uh, at least by my clock, is 9.04. And we will continue our meeting uh, with item five in the uh, agenda for this evening. All right, so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding Site Plan Review 2022-14 and Special Permit 2022-05. Center East LLC, 446 and 462 Main Street. Request site plan review approval under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 17,000 square foot, 27 unit residential mixed use building, including three affordable units with site lighting and landscaping and to request a modification of the total number of parking spaces required for the mixed use building under sections 7.0000 and 7.9 of the zoning bylaw and seek small car parking under section 7.104 of the zoning bylaw to co-locate with the existing mixed use building known as 446 Main Street and the mixed use building known as 462 Main Street, which was authorized by site plan review 2020 dash zero one and site plan review 2020 dash zero five and any subsequent amendments and request a special permit to extinguish all special permits associated with parcel 14 b dash 66 uh, from map 14 b parcel 66 and 68 in the bn zoning district First of all, are there any board member disclosures for this project? I do not see any. All right, let's go right into the presentation. Tom, you and your new team for this particular project. Uh, you have the floor and 
take it away. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst, here on uh, behalf of Center East, uh, Mr. Robleski, um, owner of Center East, 446, 462 Main Street for, as the chairman mentioned, uh, a site plan review approval for the new proposed 17,000 square foot mixed use building uh, to complement the other mixed use buildings on the site, uh, as well as a, I guess, modification by extinguishment of the existing special permits. Um, with me this evening, so John Robleski, who I'm sure you're all familiar with by this point, Mike Liu from Berkshire Design, and then also Pam, if you could let in Rachel Stevens. I, I think Rachel's, um, she's our architect. So Mike's the site designer and Rachel's the architect who can who can really walk you through um, the designs. You know, by way of a little bit of background, uh, I'm sure you've all been to the site numerous times um, for Mr. Robles, Mr. Robleski's um, initial site plan approval for the newest mixed use building and then uh, for the modification of that approval to increase the number of dwelling units. Um, we've also, as you all know, we've, we've proposed a, we filed a preliminary subdivision plan. We followed that up within seven months with a definitive subdivision plan that we are working through that process literally simultaneously with this application um, that has the effect of freezing zoning. And like we had talked about in that, hearing, but I'll mention here, um, the mixed use zoning bylaw, which we, we think is a great bylaw, but probably more appropriate to downtown South Pleasant Street, North Pleasant Street. Um, Mr. Robleski's in the, the BN zoning district. It's There's only a couple of parcels in town that's in that BN zoning district. And the mixed use zoning bylaw change to increase to require 30% of the first floor floor area. Um, and so just Mr. Robleski's thinking was given this site's location, not necessarily in the commercial corridor like the North Pleasant Street, South Pleasant Street area. Um, he looked to free zoning and we're, like I said, in the process of freezing that zoning so that he didn't have to provide that 30% of the commercial space for this new mixed use building. So that's a little bit of the context. You know, as I mentioned, it's a 17,000 square foot building, 27 proposed units, including three affordable units, um, 330 commercial, uh, 330 square feet of commercial space. Um, if approved, there is the existing mixed use building that you most recently approved that has 24 units in it. Uh, 10 one bedroom, nine two bedroom, one three bedroom, and four studios, as long as, as well as commercial space. There's the existing mixed use building at the corner of Gray and Main. Uh, maybe I'll just share my screen quickly so you can. So this is uh, obviously this building's no longer here. This building's no longer here. There is a building in this area where my my mouse and cursor is. This building uh, will remain, and that's uh, it's mixed use. There's about 1,768 square feet of commercial space there currently, and a three bedroom residential unit. And then what we're proposing, as you'll see um, through through both of the designers' presentation, we're proposing that 17,000 square foot, 27 unit. It'll have 14 one bedrooms, 13 studios, and 330 square feet of commercial space. So at the end of the day, you're looking at, as, as I don't know if I've mentioned it, but a wonderful infill development, a total of 65 beds on site and 52 uh, dwelling units. And, and so, you know, with that, I, I think I'll turn it over to Mike to walk you through the site. And then we'll turn it over to Rachel to talk a little bit about the design. And then we can come back and, and talk a little bit about management, um, maybe to get a little bit ahead of ourselves. We don't have, as you saw in the project application report, final sign off from Jason Skeels, so town engineer, fire department. So we completely expect this to be continued. So this isn't one that we're asking you to rush to close this evening. So if you do have questions and we can't answer them tonight, we'll be able to answer them for the next hearing. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mike um, and let him present. Uh, Tom, uh, I have to butt and ask procedural before you go to your presentation. 
And that is, uh, since you're doing this set of apps in parallel with the final subdivision plan, uh, what incentive do you have to submit the final subdivision plan, and carry that process through to completion if we approve this project site? So because the the way that the 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 law works is um, any building permit or special permit issued after the first publication of notice for a bylaw change is under that new bylaw. And so if we didn't freeze the zoning, I think we might've lost the chair if I'm looking at the screen correctly. I don't know if that's the case, but it looks to me to be the case. Looks like we lost him temporarily, yeah. I hope. Oh, there, he is. The there he is. Mr. Chairman. Here he is. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Zoom just uh, kicked me out. You had gotten a little broken up in your, in your question. OK. Um, I'm sorry, Tom. I missed most of your explanation there. We, we noticed that you had dropped off, so I, I stopped talking. Um, so th the comment was that the way that the law is written, it's any building permit or special permit issued after the first publication of notice of a new bylaw um, is subject to that bylaw, unless what we had done is attempt to free zoning. So we'll have to go through that subdivision process to get the endorsement in order to actually freeze the zoning. Otherwise we'll be subject to the, the current zoning bylaw. So the incentive to actually follow through so um, the so the incentive to follow through is that you won't get a building permit unless you for, follow through. Correct, not for what we're proposing now. We would have right. to comply with the new zoning bylaw. Right. right. Okay. All right. So I just thank you. All right. Go ahead. Okay. I'll, uh, Mike, I'll turn it over to you um, to walk through the site. Okay. Let's see. Oops. Hold on a sec. I gotta find my right screen here. Um, where's my folder? There we go. All right. Um, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just gonna use this um, to present the site layout and design and i have the um black and white uh plans that were submitted to you if we need to um look at anything in detail or go over that but basically this um outline here that's colored in represents the extent of the site currently it's two parcels um here next to gray street in maine at the corner is uh, 446 this is a, the existing house um, you'll see um, Rachel from Maple Street Architects. Um, uh, yep, they have some very nice uh, renderings of the proposal. So you'll see that uh, picture later. And hey, also for those of you who have gone on the site visit, you, you're familiar with um, what that looks like. Um, Mike, yes. uh, would you mind minimizing the bar to the right so that we get more image? Oh, okay, hold on. Just on that little, yeah, there we go. Okay, I can blow that up a little bit too. Um, so, and then on the uh, east side is uh, 462 or the building that kind of we refer to as Center East, um, the Center East building phase one. 
which is this, which you approved um, recently. Um, the proposal, um, the current building sits approximately right in this area. It had, or it had been demolished or taken down. Um, the proposal is to maintain basically 462 in its current state, which includes this driveway that comes up into this parking at the north end. And there's a, an additional seven spaces here um, along the east side. There's three spaces uh, here on the west side of the driveway. Um, change the configuration of the existing parking lot that was kind of in a, in a north-south orientation and changing it to an east-west orientation to make room to fit this new L-shaped building um, into the site. The footprint is 5,500 square foot plus for the new building. Um, it's on three stories and, and there you get that approximately 17,000 square foot of um, um, space on the on, divided um, on the three floors. Um, what's nice about this building, and Rachel will talk about it a little uh, later, but this building includes an indoor bike storage um, space and an indoor trash collection uh, and recycle uh, space so that, you know, there's, we're not, there's no dumpster or outdoor dumpster proposed on this site. It'll, it'll all be, you know, picked up with the truck entering the site and wheeling those, um, those bins out to the truck and, and getting them picked up that way. Um, but the idea was to try to maintain the view for, um, along Gray Street and Main Street, you know, especially as you're traveling down Main Street from the center of town. So try to maintain this green space in the front. Uh, we had actually looked at some ideas of, of, you know, being able to add parking in the front, but, you know, ultimately we, um, John primarily decided that, you know, we wanted to try to uh, get as much as we could in here and maintain this green space and it's pretty much in its, its existing um, condition. Um, let's see. So the, um, I don't know if you want me to go into the zoning and coverage and that, but we, we do fall uh, under the um, maximum allowed building coverage and site uh, coverage. Um, the, the way that the drainage works is where this parking lot, the new parking lot is actually about 1400 square feet smaller in pavement than the existing parking lot. So we are actually reducing the, uh, the runoff from paved areas or, or that dirty you know, water. Um, we will be uh, catching that in a storm scepter or storm uh, water treatment chamber before um, it's currently the design calls for it being discharged into an um, underground detention basin, which we're going to be putting in this lawn area to the, um, to the southwest part of the site. But we wanted to obviously maintain that as green space. Um, the way and the drainage on the former um, a formerly approved project here, it's, it's not being changed. Water is still from the parking lots, primarily drains uh, mm -hmm. north to south. There's a stormwater treatment chamber. Let me increase this a bit. Um, there's an existing stormwater treatment chamber right here. Water is caught here. It, it pump, it's uh, piped back into an underground detention basin that's in this green space to the south of the building. Um, this also catches roof water runoff from this uh, building. And then the overflow is piped back through a, a, um, an outlet control structure and then back into the street, uh, town's drainage system. So we're not touching that and we're trying not to direct any of the um, runoff from the Western part of the site. All this primarily is being um, the, the drainage or the stormwater runoff from the parking lot and the new roof, as well as this existing house is being uh, funneled to the underground detention basin in this area. And we can look at that layout on the, um, on the black and white plans if you'd like. But it's the same, it's the same system. Um, it's called an R tank. Um, people kind of refer to them as milk crates, but um, they're basically open um, structures that you can stack if, if needed to increase volume. 
Um, but they're, they are rated H20, so uh, for vehicular loading, but in this case, obviously we don't have, they're not being put under paved areas or, or vehicular ways. Um, they're under both under green um, spaces. Um, they're easy to maintain. They have uh, typically, they have um, observation ports that you can open and kind of do an inspection to make sure that, you know, water's draining out, siltation's not being collected within, within that structure. Um, but the underground detention basins are, are used for infiltration, attenuation of, of the peak flows, um, and then obviously to release any overflow slowly um, back into the city system if, if they overflow. Um, in terms of the, um, the landscaping, these trees along the street, along Gray Street, and these three um, at the front at Main Street are existing trees. There's a cluster of four maples. There's one right here. You can see it kind of in half tone line right there near the uh, new curb cut. We thought we would that we would lose that one, but we actually want to try to save it. Um, and that might involve some air spading of this existing tree. It might involve shifting this curb cut a couple of more feet to the north if, if you know that'll help. Um, I think that um, we'd like to try to save all these, the, the four maples here. Um, these two are large crab apple trees, and these three along Main Street are um, beech trees, which are an in interesting choice. Um, but, you know, those, those have the potential to get quite large, as you might know. And um, there's an existing wood rail fence right here. You can see that in the shaded line that runs up to the um, existing curb cut to the parking lot, which is right here. Um, we want to maintain that, obviously. Um, originally, we thought we'd take it down, but we changed our minds and decided to keep it, you know, in keeping with the, uh, the visual, the, the aesthetic, the view, you know, of this um, kind of important corner of the, uh, the property. Um, not sure. We have, um, we don't have a snow plan, but um, seeing how that, you know, comes up. Um, there are places that snow is uh, stored now uh, in the newer part of the design. We have um, this swale where snow, snow could be plowed to. There's green space here along the edge. There's green space along here, um, along the existing pavement, which is a um, um, majority of that uh, uh, paved area and parking. There's significant green space to the north here. There's um, sp uh, spaces to pile snow along the edge of the driveway and then off to the edge um, of the uh, parking spaces here on the east side. And obviously, um, as you probably know, in severe cases, uh, a lot of times, you know, some of these uh, corner spaces, if you will, um, are used to um, pile snow and um, haul it off site, truck it off site um, as needed. Um, John has done um, a lot of research and um, uh, parking counts at uh, this existing um, building, as well as other developments in town. And I'm, I'm gonna let him do a presentation later about the parking, the numbers and figures, but um, in total, there are 47 parking spaces um, within this site. Um, and I, Believe, I can't remember what was the, I forget what the unit count was, uh, but I think there's 51 total units, not bedrooms, but units. Um, and um, uh, John's gonna present the justification for the, for the number of parking um, that is proposed. But again, this is, as Tom mentioned, this is a great infill project. It's, it, I think it's just over 2000 feet to the center of town. So that's an easy, you know, five minute walk. Uh, it's, it's within walking distance to, to the university. Obviously, it's very close to Amherst College. Um, it's on a bus route. There's a bus uh, stop right here. You can see the shelter um, and pull off on Main Street. Um, the site is about, the, the railroad tracks are about the midpoint between, um, you know, um, South, South Pleasant, North Pleasant, and um, uh, Southeast Street, Northeast Street intersection to the east. Uh, so this, you know, this site, this uh, property here, it's also, you know, within walking distance to, you know, to the east, to the village center, 
um, to the south, or I should say, um, I guess you call it the Southeast Village, Southeast Street Village Center area. Um, that is, you know, obviously slated for development, um, you know, in the Village Center District there. Um, I probably missed something, so some questions will come up, but we'll be happy to entertain those. I guess uh, at this point, I'd like to turn turn it over to either Rachel or I'm not sure if John wants to talk about the parking before we get into the architecture. Um, I'll leave that to you, John and Rachel, if, uh, if either of you want to um, go there and uh, obviously we can come back to the site plans uh, if and when needed. I think we should probably let Rachel uh, do her thing on the architecture and then address questions as they come along unless somebody disagrees. All right, Are, is everyone seeing my screen now? Yes. Great. So um, we prepared some initial renderings. Again, as the previous team mentioned, we are in schematic design, so we're still making changes. This is um, a, a new version from the plans that we submitted a month ago, showing some different coloring as requested by the planning board. And um, we are looking at the different views of the project as you move through the neighborhood. Um, and you see the building in context with the previous um, building that was occupied in August last year, which has been a nice addition to the neighborhood and has been appreciated by the neighbors in the town. So this is looking to build on that success and, and add some more density of housing for the town of Amherst, which I think is a great addition and still maintaining the, um, the existing historic structure on the corner as well. So um, here are some views looking at the building from across the street. Um, and you can see how it wraps around this existing two-story structure on the corner and relates to the other building, um, the, the first building of Center East Commons. Um, and then here's a view from the north side on Gray Street. Um, this is this is a bird's eye view a little bit so that you can see both buildings in their entirety. It's very shielded from this side, as you can see in the first page rendering. There's a lot of vegetation on this side protecting the larger buildings from the more, um, the single family residential that's a little bit further north on Gray Street. Um, so you can see here how the building is taking a lot of the same language from the first phase. Um, similar coloring, but in a contrasting style um, to blend in as a, a sort of a neighborhood feel for this unit. And in fact, this building does provide some of the site amenities for the first building that are currently housed in a temporary shed um, while this building is being designed. So looking at the first floor plan, you can see some of those site amenities. Um, the indoor bicycle storage and um, the trash and recycling that will be shared for both buildings. Um, there's also a common laundry that is planned for this building only um, and mechanical room on this level that, um, that is not residential space. And then the um, commercial space is an office here on the front corner that is closest to the parking that is um, nearest to Main Street. Um, and it has a door access from the porch. Um, so it, it has the front facing commercial um, access. Um, there's also a studio on that end of the building. And um, the existing building here also provides a doorway that faces the, um, the sidewalk to that existing parking as well. So then you have um, three main entry points for the other groups of apartments. Um, there's an entry point here that goes upstairs to all second and third floor units. There's an entry point here that serves three floors of units and an entry point here that serves three, point, three floors of units. There's an affordable unit on each floor and there is um, an accessible unit on the first floor 
And all of the other units on the first floor are designed to be adaptable, which means they can be um, made more accessible should the need arise for any of the residents on the first level. They have a little bit of extra space. Their doors are a little extra larger. Um, and then on the second floor, many of the layouts are repeated and some of them um, are different where it's over the office space. Um, here you can see the affordable studio unit. And um, as you can see, there's a mix of studio and one bedroom, which seems to be the most popular um, type of unit in this area, given a lot of um, housing for prof uh, young professionals and students and um, professors and the like. So here we have the uh, one bedrooms are highlighted in yellow, the studios are highlighted in green. And again, on the third floor, very similar layout. Um, so the elevations don't show the new coloring, but um, if you have any questions about that, we can talk about that as well. We also have a sign plan. Um, this is the existing sign that um, has been on the site since before the first project was completed. And now that we have many fewer businesses, um, as businesses are going more and more remote these days we're finding, um, we think it's more appropriate to have a larger sign that announces the complex as a whole, and that would be Center East Commons as a more monument style sign. Um, and it would be um, slightly shorter than the existing sign, but with the larger lettering that you can see and it gives people a clear idea of where they're accessing the site. That would be located here for the main entry here to the parking on both sides of the complex. Um, there's also a sign at this location for the previous projects commercial space and then a sign here that would likely be similar um, on the front of the office or commercial space at the south end of the new building. Um, so that is the overview on architecture and um, again, as Mike mentioned, also happy to answer any questions that come up. Okay, thank you, thank you all. It's great to see these renderings and give us a good sense of what's what you're proposing. Um, board members, are there? Would you like to make some comments this evening? I think we will probably be continuing this hearing. Uh, would you like to get into it a little bit, or should we move right to a continuation? Uh, not seeing any hands, I'll make a couple of, I have a couple of questions, I guess. Um, my first question is on the site plan. And uh, uh, it, and the, the distance between the existing house and the new building. Um, in my work for institutional clients, uh, the distance I'm seeing between the north end of the house and the south face of the L looks like a lot less than would typically be allowed by the building code. Um, and it also looks rather unpleasant for the people that might be in the units that look right out at the end of the house. So I wondered if you could talk about that. I can give you the distances and um, maybe Rachel can talk about the, the, the building code um, issues with that. But um, basically, can, you can see my screen there. Yes. Uh, um, from the existing um, building here to the new wall, that's uh, five feet, I believe. It's 13 feet from the main wall, which is here. This is kind of like an entry um, portico or vet, uh, elongated vestibule, if you will. Um, and then from the east wall of the existing building to the new uh, building wall is also 13 feet. So we've kept 13 feet from the main walls and this area within, um, between the two buildings is 
is going to be um, or, or plan to be like um, uh, kind of a mechanical space. There will be air handling units here. We are proposing that the, um, um, the surface just be treated as stone mulch for ease of maintenance. And, um, uh, you know, so it'll, it'll just be more difficult to try to keep up grass or maintain vegetation, uh, shrubs, certainly in that area. Um, along with the, um, you know, the, the mechanical um, units that would be required um, to be put on the ground there. So those are the distances. Um, I wouldn't be able to talk about the um, code implications with that. And maybe okay. I can. All right. So, uh, Rachel, uh, are there any issues with the, the short, the small distance between those structures? Yep. Sorry, I was sharing my screen. I couldn't find the mute button. Okay, so the the um, fire code is something that we started to work on at the very beginning of this project. And we um, made sure to look at all of the different um, distances and the impl implications on the buildings. And this approach that we chose is trying to maximize the, um, it's trying to maximize the visibility of the existing building on the corner of the site to allow the new building to take a second stage to that building. And um, by wrapping it around, it allows um, that new building to have a sort of a smaller presence on Gray Street as well as Main Street. And um, we're maintaining five feet from the north of that shed, which will allow us to provide a one hour rating on that shed wall. Um, and that will give us the um, the ability to have windows on the south side of the new building. And then the 13 foot distance um, allows us to have windows on both buildings and to maintain that airspace there as required by code. So we have looked at that very carefully and, um, and have a, a setback plan in place to discuss with Mike Roy for the, for the fire department. Um, we, we do recognize that that's, as the chair mentioned, it's um, maybe not the best view from the south windows of that one particular unit that's right up against the shed, um, but it is um, a really nice view up on the, on the other units towards the south. And so we wanted to make sure that we provided some of that south view for the upper units and um, the lower units will be looking into the courtyard. And that's something that if somebody is looking for a unit that um, may not be more publicly facing, they might choose a unit that has more of an interior focus. Um, we've noticed that we do a lot of residential design for a lot of different clients. And um, some clients are more inwardly focused in their residences and some are more outwardly focused. And a lot of the residents at the first building um, don't ever open their curtains. And that's true of other um, multifamily residential units that we've seen. So there are a lot of people who prefer to have a more inwardly focused um, residence to begin with. Okay, thank you. I guess the only other question I had was on your, your elevation. Uh, I guess it would be the east face uh, where the I think the, the, was it the trash or the uh, bicycle storage was? Uh, I didn't see a porch over that door in the elevation. Is that gonna be covered or not? Yeah, that, that, that door right in that little corner there doesn't look like it has a roof over it. You're on mute. Rachel, you're muted. Oops. Or else. Whoops. Thank you. Sorry. 
I'm having trouble finding that button when I'm screen sharing. Um, mm -hmm. So the, there's an overhang in the building itself. There's a two foot overhang from the upper stories over this door. Um, so it's possible um, that we will, in, as we fine tune the design, um, that we could provide an additional overhang for that um, entry point, but um, it's something that we feel is already quite protected by the, the building architecture above that door. Okay, thank you. Um, Maria. Um, I know that this will continue. So maybe I'll just make some comments so that maybe for the next round, we can see more um, information. Um, as far as the architecture, all we had was a gray L shape. So I'm seeing all the architecture for the first time. So it's hard to sort of digest all of it. But um, uh, hearing what you're saying, Rachel, about how the L building is sort of secondary to the historic front building, I don't really get that sense. I felt like it was looming and I wonder maybe it's because of that space you were talking about that, you know, it, because of the site constraints, you know, in order to get enough parking and all the other things that building had to be that close to the uh, historic original one. I, I do feel like it's not quite doing what you're saying. Um, I'm not sure how to resolve that. But um, I really appreciate the project because we so desperately need info housing and more mixed use buildings um, close to downtown, on bus routes, walkable, you know, within five minute radius. That's fantastic. It's just like, I, I do feel like it is sort of hovering over the original building and um, the historic building, I assume you aren't able to alter the colors or anything. I, maybe, I mean, that that's probably uh, part of the, commission's purview, um, but if they could tie together better so that the whole parcel is a little more cohesive, maybe it won't feel so jarring. But again, I'm just seeing the architecture for the first time in your presentation. So it's hard to kind of really, um, gauge. so maybe at the next round, if we see a little, or if it's in our packets or something, or we didn't get it in our packets, right? I hope yeah, I Maria, the, we received the PDFs of the drawings yesterday maybe oh, midday okay. maybe it was a it was a link to a dropbox site um, oh okay so, i so they yeah. were late arrivals okay i i'm so far behind on emails okay sorry so that that's on me um well so i guess yeah my only comment is uh from maybe next round if we can see a little mo bit more like perspective view just so i feel a little more comfortable that you know in reality it won't feel like this big hulking thing hovering over this original little historic building that you work so hard to preserve so um but otherwise uh yeah i know we're continuing so I, I won't say too much more can i respond to that briefly sure um so we did submit plans um a month ago for this project, they, these are just updated renderings. The, the previous renderings had a different color. And um, what we sent recently was um, an updated color scheme. So, uh, and I also misspoke this, this existing building is, um, it's, I don't think it's protected by the Historic Commission. I think it's, um, or, I'm sure, sorry, I, I'm not sure if it is or not, but it's something that um, that John is preserving to, pr to preserve the fabric of the neighborhood and to preserve the look of the corner of the site. Um, and he is interested in changing the color um, at some point. And um, that's something that we can certainly show in renderings if that would be useful for the for the board to consider. Um, it's it's certainly, I mean, as a two-story building, it's certainly always going to feel a lot smaller than this new um, three-story building. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Chris? I just wanted to suggest that if you made the color of the front building, the old building, more similar to the color of the new building, it might appear to be part of the new building rather than something that kind of sticks out in front. And that might help with the image of something looming over something else. Okay, thank you, Chris. Janet? That's a great suggestion. Uh, well, hold on, why don't we, Janet, why don't we let John sure. probably respond to that? 
Thank you. Yeah, in fact, um, when the doctors converted that corner building 446 from uh, two family, I believe it was into commercial on the first floor to have their doctor's offices there, that building was actually kind of a light blue. If you look at some of the uh, old file photographs, uh, light, light blue and some darker trim, I think. Uh, when the Gadara family bought it and it became Spanish Studies, um, a broad building, they wanted to you know, have more of a look for their European look, I guess. So they painted it the color it is now. So that's how that color came about. <laughs> All but right. I agree. I'm trying to blend everything there. I did get a lot of positive comments on the color of the the building that we did last year and the way it looks in general. So that's why we kind of blended the two. Just I wanted the opposite color of the front of the one we did last year was kind of blue in the front. So this one here, I want to have the green color in the front and then kind of have the uh, bump outs mimic different colors like the other building. Okay, thank you, Janet. So um, I do appreciate the um, infill and residential den density in the business districts. It's like we're sort of filling in the core, um, and you know, with the goal of you know obviously meeting housing needs and also um, supporting businesses um, where people can walk to. Um, I am concerned that we're that original goal is that um, we're residential. In, business units we're going to support businesses is now they're replacing them. And so, you know, we're going from having seven or eight commercial spaces down to three and they're all, except for one is the, the new one is quite small. And so I, I, I'd like to talk about that later, be at a different meeting, but I do want to support um, the comments that Doug made is that I don't know anybody who would want to be staring at a building five feet away with gravel and then maybe some heating or you know cooling units. It's it's sort of it feels sort of tenement like to me. And um, that build those buildings seem way too close. And I, I don't know people who want to be staring. You know I know in New York City that's the kind of wall you don't want to have. And I, I don't know it seems really far from our kind of usual situation in Amherst. So I, I would think that it just has to move back um, to give some space. Um, it looks like you're trying to pack a really large building in. And it does have a very looming feeling. It feels like the, the, the smaller building is completely surrounded. I think part of the problem, so I feel like it has to be sort of reduced in size or maybe the front of the building look more like the front of a building on Main Street with more details, like a deeper porch, some more details around the windows, a small, like smaller size. It does, it just feels like that building is surrounding that little house and you're just trying to put in as much as you can. And the details on the window or on the house itself, it's just very flat and plain and very blank to me. So I, I, I just think there has to be some, a better kind of fit in terms of the vibe of Main Street. I mean, Main Street is now full of sort of a lot of, you know, different houses kind of of different sizes and different, you know, designs. A lot of them are kind of falling apart, but it still has like a nice vibe. And I feel like this house, this new building doesn't have that feel of, it's not different enough, it's not detailed enough, but it, it feels way too big to me. And it does feel like it's looming. Um, and it seems really close to the house. And I, it's hard for me that the tenants on either side would really wanna be just staring into the windows of other people. So those, So I do have that kind of initial like, it just, it feels like that house is surrounding and almost, you know, the, not the house, the building is surrounding and almost eating the little house or something. I don't, it doesn't look right to me. Thank you, Janet. John. Thank you. Yeah, you got to realize that that bump out area, so to speak, and behind the original house, the only section of that that's five feet away is eight feet wide by 22 feet long. Um, and that was added on when the doctors did the conversion of the house also, just to gain a handicapped entrance with a ramp and handicapped bathroom. So that is like a shed roof on the back of that. And I think Rachel's trying to bring up the actual photo of the uh, existing house in the back there showing that shed roof. So most of that building is 13 feet away and the way the roof is on the existing building, 
Uh, the second story will get plenty of sunlight coming down the roof line there. And the first story, we arranged the bedroom windows on the corner unit to be facing, that's about the only window that really faces that five foot separation area. Um, the other areas will either look down to the west side of this house, down where that gutter and, and the pressure treated wood is, or down the 13 foot alleyway, looking out to Main Street uh, on the other end. That's a studio unit there. And the HVAC units are not big ones like we have next door. They're gonna be like a suitcase size, 11 inches wide, 33 inches, I'm sorry, at 33 inches wide, 11 inches deep and 22 inches high. So they're gonna be below the windows for the most part or in between the windows. So I understand what you're saying there. We, I tried to work everything around that. So tenants weren't impacted you know, negatively there. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, are there other board comments this evening or? I'm wondering, it's just a short of 10 o'clock. Maybe we should call this uh, the presentation for this evening and continue until a later meeting. Would anybody like to make any more comments this evening? All right. Um, uh, would the, would, are there any members of the public that would like to make a comment? I do see five public attendees who are still with us. Okay, not seeing any hands from the, oh, there's one from Pam Rooney. Pam, could you give us your name and your address? Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I have a question about the number of parking spaces and I'm curious what the, uh, the math is to, um, um, to come up with the number that you have, because it sounds like um, you have I think I heard someone say 47 parking spaces. I didn't catch the number of dwelling units and I definitely didn't catch the number of bedrooms and just wonder if you could elaborate. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. John, do you want to address that? Yeah, did you want to get into all the data and so forth tonight or kind of give a basic rundown? Why don't you give us a basic rundown and you know, we can study some of the material and come yeah. back and talk about it in more depth at the next one. All right, yeah, I appreciate your, your asking about that. Um, when we built the building that was uh, constructed last year, I did a lot of research in early morning hours to find out how many parking spaces were actually used in the area of similar complexes. And then I did it again this year and did the same complexes plus a couple more newer ones that are of similar size with the combined thing here. So the building that we did last year has 35 bedrooms and it turned out once everything was leased, there was only 16 cars for the uh, 35 bedrooms and there was 32 parking spaces when it was approved. Uh, so we used kind of that same ratio and the average ratio of the data that I collected you know, to come up with this number of spaces, it's actually about four more spaces than that number comes out to be. So next meeting, I can certainly go over all the details on that, but it was through research and, and looking at the way people work from home now and so forth and, uh, and that type of thing. And it's the location itself, but a bus stop right on the premises, right out the front door. So it all comes together to, to verify that 47 spaces should work. All right, thank you, John. All right, so we will pick, up, pick this up uh, at another meeting. Uh, Chris, do you have a suggestion for a date for this continuation? I would suggest June 15th. June 15th, you have... Um kind of a light load um, among which are possible review of the dog park, um, <clears throat> possible discussion about Article 14 and how to um, carry that into the future. 
um, legal ad fees and the subdivision issue that will come up later in this meeting um, for a brief discussion. Okay. So, Thank you. so uh, what time? What time would you propose? There's nothing um, scheduled so far, so you could propose this for six thirty-five. Okay. So no chance of getting it on a June first. No, June first is really packed. Unless you wanted to switch your subdivision to June fifteenth. Mr. Marshall, Mr. Malloy also has. Yeah, his yeah, I see his hand. I'm. Uh, what, Nate? Why don't you go ahead? Sure. Thanks. I mean, I was going to just ask, you know, there are some suggestions about reducing the massing facing Main Street, whether that's like a two story building or more articulation. And if that's something the board would want to see for the next meeting, you know, even a change in the building, what if it were, you know, wasn't an L shape, but some other different shape. Um, I, my two other comments are that the, the interior walls of the new building, right? So that courtyard with the old building, there's no articulation on the facade like there is on the other facades, right? Stepping back and other things. So that really is just a, a wall facing the old historic house, you know, on the west side and the south side of the new building. And so, you know, if there is more relationship to the uh, current existing house, whether it's, you know, window patterns or, you know, the facade um, patterns of opening, closing windows, whatever, um, it really is just a, you know, a, a really big wall facing the old building. Um, and then just, you know, the board didn't look at it much with the sign along Main Street. I just want to just call attention to it and how it is different than the existing sign. And it, you know, is that a type of sign, you know, we'd want to see as we're coming up Main Street? Is it, you know, is the style and design, um, you know, is that, is it also representative of, of say the vicinity and the home? So, um, you know, I just wanted to call attention to that, you know, some site details, just if the applicants are coming back, if there's any comments like we did with EMS five, you know, right. other things that could be addressed next time. Right. Well, thanks for bringing up the massing of the building. Um, I, I have to say that one of the things that went through my head was, why are we keeping the existing house? Um, you know, should this be a project that replaces the house and flips the L diagonally so it fronts uh, Gray Street and fronts Main Street. Um, you know, then you've got an interior courtyard behind it and plenty of room for your parking. Um, obviously that would change the, uh, the look of, the, of Main Street with you know, what has been a series of small houses, but we're, we're losing that too. Um, I'm not sure I'm really arguing for that. I'm simply saying that went through my head um, it does feel like it's a it's a site plan that is just too cramped. Um, so, uh, if you have some other ideas, John and team, um, you know, I think we probably would like to think about that. Well, I think you know my my whole goal was I did think of tearing the house down, and I went through that with the first one next door, and I thought you know, it was more important for the neighborhood to kind of maintain the look of what that corner is versus something that's totally different. And as far as the sign, uh, Nate, um, the Amherst Media sign is very similar to the one we're talking about here. Nothing like um, the post signs. It's a stone sign with the sign in, in the center of it and so forth. And that's gonna be built right next door on the corner, the other corner of gray. So the, I understand the massive look that you're talking about. And that's really when you're looking front on from Main Street, when you're coming down Main Street or up Main Street, it kind of blends, you know, coming, especially coming down with the building we did last year. The roof line is going to be about the same. The houses on the west side of Gray Street are higher yet. Once the Amherst Media building goes up, it's going to kind of mask this whole thing. So it's it's a massive look from the front, I think. But it still has plenty of room. And I think it, it'll blend in nice the way it is. So 
that's kind of my thoughts when I was going through everything. I I did have a plan with putting the building in the front of the existing building, and I played with all kinds of different ideas. And this seemed to make most sense with trying to keep with what's there, so the neighborhood doesn't change that much, and blend it with some new. So, all right. Thank you, John. Uh, Chris, I just wanted to point out that um, if there was a proposal to take down the existing house. I think there might also be a, a risk of uh, having a 12 month demolition delay on that. Um, and I actually told Mr. Roboleski that I thought it would be better to keep the existing house so that he would be able to keep some of the streetscape that already exists. So I just wanted to offer that, but there were changes made to the existing building to um, in response to comments that were received from the planning board, such as making the piece that faces Main Street be a smaller size. And so you can see that in this image here, the piece that is closest to Main Street is smaller and then it kind of steps up and steps up more or steps out more as you go towards the back. And maybe that's something that could be considered some kind of diminution of this facade that's on Main Street and would help that to feel less monumental. Thanks, Chris. I think that's, uh, those are good, good points. Janet. So I really hope you don't take down that building and change. I, I appreciate that you want to keep that the kind of rhythm and the look of Main Street. And part of it is like every building on Main Street, you know, they're small, they're not really small. There's lots of really big buildings on Main Street. They all look different. And I think part of the thing is if you look at the building on the left, it has all these interesting and quirky details. And the new building has really almost none. And then the building next to it actually has some more, but it looks too much like it in a way. And so I just think you could do a lot more details. I do think it's way too big. But to make it an interesting front, so you're, you know, it's a, it's a building on Main Street. It should have a cool look. It should have architectural details, and it just looks very flat. And I don't know. I just, you know, I, and and you know, so that, so I really do think it could fit in more. Um, and I would urge you to do sort of more details. I don't have the right, you know, language for that, but I'm kind of in that. I know when I see it, but every building on Main Street almost has some interesting thing. And the building that you tore down was one of the more interesting buildings. And so I, I don't want to lose that rhythm of different buildings. And these two side by side don't have that rhythm. And this building particularly doesn't have enough detail or interest, you know, to me. Um, the other issue I have is there's like, is with the site, there's really no space for people to sit or gather or there's no, um, you know, I, I don't know, there's, you know, I thought that in the building that you had built that people could do, um, be in the backyards and, you know, have some place to sit and put a chair until I realized when I went to the site visit that there were no doorways out. And so nobody really was using that kind of green space in any way. And with this design, there's really no green space left for people except maybe the front lawn. And it made me wonder if the buildings, the new building could have like porches so people could sit on porches you know along the side in the front like a deeper porch or have a seating area in the front that invites people but there's you know there's going to be hundreds of people living here and there's no communal space um you know 11 east pleasant had a workout space inside they had this very tiny courtyard but is there some way to create a community out of this site and um provide some recreational facilities and amenities for the tenants it just looks like, you know, it looks like housing and there's nothing really for the tenants to have to live there that is drive up or walk up and go in their room and come out. And I just, I, I felt like it could, you could create some more communal spaces that would create a good spirit. Um, thanks, Janet. Um, I, I did want to say I, I liked Chris's suggestion of looking at perhaps reducing the mass of the wing that faces uh, Main Street, particularly on the end. Um, I'm also, I've also been kind of uh, puzzled or concerned about the two doors that, fa uh, that are on that elevation, one of which is an office and the other of which is a residence. They're, they look basically indistinguishable from each other. 
and um, you know, it seemed like it might be appropriate to have a more more of a distinction between the commercial entrance and the uh, the residential uh, unit. Uh, that that unit looks like you could probably move the front door around to the uh, west side, uh, which would which would help with separation, and and might just save the resident from having a few people that are looking from the business uh, from knocking on their door. Um, so those are a couple more thoughts that you might consider before you come back. Rachel, I do see your hand. Why don't you go ahead? Um, so just responding to a few of those comments, um, I, I think that's a great suggestion about the entry to that unit. Um, there was some consideration about having that unit be the option of having a second business space there. Um, should there be more demand for commercial space? Um, I think what John has found recently, he, he has the, the existing commercial space in the other building has not been filling and, um, you know, there's one of the wonderful benefits of having a lot of commercial space downtown is that, you know, people who want to have commercial space can be downtown and, and people out in this more residential area are looking more for residences. Um, but, um, but that said, um, I think that is a great idea to move that door um, and it still wouldn't defeat the option of having a, a second commercial space there if need be. Um, and then in terms of the sitting area, I actually um, spent a good deal of time at John's property that's around the corner on High Street. Um, we were good friends with one of the residents there and um, I only once sat out in that backyard and never saw anyone in those backyards. And th those are all built with very lovely back decks that have rear entrances to the backyards. And um, John created some really nice courtyard spaces there. And there's just really never anybody in those outdoor areas. And, um, you know, I think there's there, there's a lot to be said for creating community as as um, Ms. McGowan mentioned and, and creating space to create that community. Um, but, you know, as was mentioned also with the um, seating areas on Route 9, you don't want to build something that nobody's going to use. So I think um, one of the things that John is um, thinking about in creating this site here is that it's very, um, very much allowing the building to protect the back portion of the site and um, and then to create these green areas here that are um, in, that are taking advantage of the existing large trees that are there and there could be some very nice sitting areas here if people did want to sit outside um, there's nice planted areas on that side of the building as well as um, the you know the backyard areas up here that are much quieter and away from all of the street views. So I think there are options for the tenants should they decide to change their ways and be more outward facing. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, John? Thank you. Yeah, and as I said, you know, from kind of day one on, on this, we saved a lot of the uh, granite type capstones from the foundation that we demolished. So my thought was to use those number one on the front sign for planning better around there. So we had that aspect of part of history, so to speak. And also same thing I did next door at uh, 22 High Street. I used some stones from an old barn there for plantings, uh, planting beds and to make a couple of stone benches. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, and I'm talking from a, a police perspective now, and I saw it just uh, about a week and a half ago before graduation, further up Gray Street, where they had a nice big backyard. Uh, there was about 30 people back there playing beer pong and so forth. So when you think about creating areas that people can congregate in, I think you have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, but again, as Rachel said, I've never seen anybody use those spaces over on High Street. Uh, a couple of people might have a grill now and then that you just put out back. Um, those have been an issue with uh, melting the vinyl siding and that type of thing. They never clean them up. 
Uh, initially on High Street, I had two picnic tables or a picnic area. Um, they basically busted and fell apart and stuff. Um, we tried to maintain them. It just, I think people nowadays, especially like their privacy and they have places to go and they go out the door and they just go. Um, they're just the way it is. So I think having some areas like this and maintaining a nice shaded area where they do have an opportunity to sit is fine, but having too much, I think is probably not a good idea. All right. Thank you very much. So thank you, John and your team. Uh, I think we will, uh, it's probably time to go ahead and continue this hearing. Uh, would anybody like to make a motion to continue this hearing to June fifteenth at six thirty-five? Tom, I move. Thank you, and I'll go ahead and second that. Uh, any further discussion from the board? Uh, Rachel, you could stop sharing. Okay, not seeing any more. Uh, roll call vote. Maria? Approve. Uh, Jack, or uh, Tom, rather. Aye. Andrew? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I'm an I as well. So, John, thanks very much. Uh, I hope you'll you. take some of our comments into consideration, and we'll see you in, I guess, close to a month. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you. Okay. The time is 1013. And uh, we will go to number six on our agenda. Old business. Chris, uh, SUB 1989-9, The Meadows. You want to have any introduction little, to this? Sure, I'll give you a little rundown on this. Um, so uh, the Meadows was built um, around the same time that Amherst Hills was built and um, built by the same developer. Um, the Meadows has had um, similar issues with getting their infrastructure finished. And, um, you know, they're hoping to have their roads accepted by the town eventually. Um, what I've heard from um, Tofino Associates and Ted Parker is that um, he definitely intends to um, make that his next project now that he's finished Amherst Hills. Um, and yet the, uh, the residents at, of um, the Meadows are anxious to move the project along more quickly. So they've had their attorney, Felicity Hardy, submit this letter to the planning board in hopes that the planning board can help them to have a positive result like uh, Amherst Hills had. And so I wanted to make sure that you saw this letter in a timely manner, um, but obviously you don't have time to really discuss it in depth tonight. So I told Ms. Hardy that we would put this on the agenda for June 15th. And um, that's really what I wanted to say tonight. Okay. And, um, you know, we, you did send us some correspondence from, I think it was Mr. Parker and maybe his attorney. Um, That's uh, correct. Will you, will, he you, will you be consulting with uh, the town council at all on this before we talk about it or not? I wasn't planning to. There's a lot um, happening in the next couple of weeks, and I wasn't planning to get the town councilor involved um, unless you want me to. I okay. think that Mr. Uh, Pill is probably correct that there's no mechanism by which um, the planning board could tie uh, a decision on the Amherst Hill subdivision to um, a decision on the Meadows subdivision. Um, so he's probably correct in that matter, but I think it was, you know, right of Ms. Hardy to bring this to your attention and hopefully we can help um, that neighborhood group, you know, move towards success as well. Okay. All right. 
Um, do any board members want to say anything about that this evening, or are you fine with waiting to talk about it in about a month? Johanna. I just, it seems like we got, so Chris, I appreciate you saying that we can't kind of make one neighborhood decision contingent upon another decision. It, you know, I do feel like we got that letter, I think either the same day or the day after we voted on the Amherst Woods um, decision. And I don't know, it just, it seems like you've done a great job ushering that one to resolution. And I hope we can do the same thing here. And if we had been able to use Amherst Woods to leverage action on this, I don't know, it seems like it could have been an opportunity, but timing wise, we missed that. And then it sounds like you're saying that that just wouldn't be kind of okay one way or the other. Okay. Uh, Chris, do you want to comment? I, it was Amherst Hills, right? Amherst Rather. Hills, yeah. Thank I you. just Sorry. wanted to comment on the timing of this because, um, you know, we look at the planning board um, email before planning board meetings to make sure that we've caught everything. And um, so we looked at the planning board email before the meeting on May 4th, and this document didn't show up. And um, for some reason, it came to us like the following Monday. And so that was very strange. And we let um, Ms. Hardy know that. And it turned out that um, Ted Parker was copied on the email and his arrived several days after May 3rd. So for some reason, this did not arrive in the planning department email on May 3rd as it was indicated to have been sent. So um, that is a mystery how that happened. Um, but in any event, it, we could not have tied Amherst Hills to this because they're really two completely separate situations. They're similar, but they're separate. So thank you. Okay. All right. Um, any other old business that you want to bring up this evening? No, no, thank you. All right. How about new business item eight on our agenda? I can't think of any new business. Okay. Uh, item nine, any upcoming form A and R subdivision applications? We have some upcoming. Um, there are two upcoming that you'll see on June 1st. One has to do with a property on Pelham Road and the other one has to do with um, Archipelago Investments property at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. Um, so you'll be seeing those on June 1st. Okay. How about ZBA applications? We actually do have uh, some to present to you. Okay. Anything? I'm just, I made a couple of slides because it's always so much for me to try to remember. So um, these three applications have come in very recently. They are going to go in front of the ZBA on June 9th. The first one is property at 103 Pelham Road. Um, and they are requesting an, a variance to allow subdivision of a parcel of land. Um, and it looks like this. And what they want to do, so there are existing buildings on this property now, so one and two. So they're gonna actually, um, divide the property a little different. So this is it currently right here. So here's parcel one, here is parcel two. So this bottom piece is gonna become part of lot two. And then they're just gonna have this little piece up here is gonna be lot one. So that's the first one. Uh, secondly is um, property at 82 Pomeroy Lane. And um, these folks are seeking a special permit to create a flag lot. So here it is here, this is the parcel. And as you can see over here, they're proposing that the building circle 
would go here. So this one also is pretty straightforward. And last but not least is property at 77 North Whitney Street. So this is a request for a special permit to allow um, a new non-owner occupied duplex. And it would be a complementary principal use to an existing one family detached dwelling that's already existing on the property. So here's the property here. Here is the existing uh, one family residence. And what they're proposing is to add this duplex plan here, and it would be in front. So it would be up here in the front. So that's what's gonna go in front of the ZBA on June 9th. And so if you are interested, we can ask these applicants to come in um, and provide you a presentation on any of the applications that you are interested in. So Chris, uh, this would need to be June 1st? Yes, it would need to be. And June 1st is already chock full. Yeah, this is already pretty, pretty full. Um, I know board members at, at 20 minutes after 10, you know, the invitation to take on more for our next meeting is not particularly exciting. Um, does anybody feel strongly that we need to get a presentation and make a recommendation to ZBA? Uh, Chris, I see your hand. I just wanted to suggest that if people do feel strongly that they want to see this presentation, they could attend the June 9th Zoning Board of Appeals meeting and they would be um, free to comment as a member of the public at that time. So that's a, just a suggestion. Okay, thank you. Janet? Um, I'm interested in the first one and the third one, both because they're sort of weird and they sort of remind me of the um, College Avenue one where, you know, building extra units on increasingly smaller lots, but I don't particularly wanna pack the agenda um, of the next meeting. Could we hear it even though the Z could get a presentation? I'm, I'm sure the ZBA is not gonna decide number one and three quickly. I, I, I don't know if I'm presuming that, but I, I think that. Could we hear it at a different meeting, Chris? Um, we couldn't guarantee that the ZBA would continue the public hearing, but if you, wanted to, I could make a suggestion to Maureen Pollack that if it is continued past June 9th, that you have an opportunity to hear a presentation. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. I mean, it's just, right. the first one just seems weird, but. Well, you're going to see the first one as an A&R. Okay. So I don't know if you want to see it as a, and that's, and that's essentially what it is. The ZBA would be granting a variance to allow um, the applicant to A and R the lot, so like there's a, not going to be much more to the first one than that. Is it is it, it is is it dividing it to two house? There's two houses, so one house would be on a very very tiny lot. That's right. Yes, but yeah. they're not adding anything to it. It's just yeah. an existing building that is going to be um, on a different size lot. Yeah, interesting. This, I think this one on 77 Whitney. North Whitney, that could potentially be an interesting site design for you to look at and to comment on. So, All right, so Chris, why don't you go ahead and have that conversation with, um, I'm blanking on her name. Maureen. Uh, Maureen. With Maureen, that, thank you. That would only be for the first one and the third one, for one of yeah. you. So, you know, just have her, Keep us in the loop, and uh, if they do not decide on their June 9th meeting, we can. We'd like to talk. We'd like to hear about it. Okay, very good. All right. Um, upcoming. Well, let's see. I'll just give you a time check. The time is 10:25. Uh, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. None that I know of. None yet. All right. Uh, Number 12, planning board 
committee and liaison reports. Jack is absent, so we don't need to hear from about PVPC. Uh, Andrew, anything on CPAC? We're trying to schedule a meeting. Um, the chair threw out a couple of dates. I don't know if we landed on one yet, but it, we were looking at early June. Okay. So no updates other than that. All right. Uh, Tom, design review board. No updates. All right. Janet, solar bylaw. You are muted. As far as I know, the committee has not formed, but I think they may get appointed on June 9th by the town council, but I'm not, I'm not super firm on that. Okay, thank you. And then Chris, anything else on CRC? CRC um, is talking to the building commissioner about the rental registration bylaw and trying to come up with a new updated version of that. And that's what they talked about on May 12th. And as I told you before, they also voted to um, recommend the um, demo, uh, excuse me, the preservation of historically significant buildings. So. Okay, great. All right. Uh, I'm not going to have any report from the chair tonight. Uh, Chris, any report from staff? Well, I just want to say that this length of this meeting differed substantially <laughs> from the length of the last meeting. <laughs> well, and it sounds like we're going to have a busy summer. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. There's a lot happening in Amherst. <laughs> All right. Well. So thank you all for sticking with us. And uh, yep, I'm feeling like yawning also. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Uh, the time is 10 right, thank you. and we are adjourned. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Thanks. Nate. Bye, everyone. Thank you all in June. All righty. Okay. Bye-bye. Stop recording. Good night.